Okay. Good morning, everybody. I want to open uh, our discussion regarding Africa. I'm very happy to see you here with us today. And uh, before uh, entering into the uh, <coughs> concept and the, all the issues that connected to Africa soil and seeing what's happened in Africa, I will ask my uh, uh, assistant to come and to describe who are the people in the panel and then we uh, uh, continue our discussion, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, so we have uh, six. Uh, we have six panelists today. Uh, I'm just going to go briefly through the biography of each one of them, and then we will begin the discussion. So the um, moderator for this panelist, or main one, is uh, Dr. Etanazani. Uh, he's Colonel Reserve uh, in Israel. He currently serves as Deputy Executive Director of the Institute for Counterterrorism, uh, ICT, and the head of the BA and MA specialization in counterterrorism and homeland security at the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy at the Interdisciplinary Center, IDC Herzliya. Dr. Zani obtained his BA in Economy, Political Science, and Geography at Bar Ilan University, Israel, and his MA with honors in Security and Strategy Studies program of Tel Aviv University. Dr. Zani's PhD dissertation for the Hebrew University in Jerusalem was on the development of revolutionary Islamic movements, a case study of Hezbollah. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Mr. Um, Aaron Zellin. Uh, Mr. Zellin is the Richard Burrow Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and Renner and Sammy David Fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence. He is also a PhD, PhD candidate at King's College London, uh, where his dissertation is on the history of the Tunisian Jihadi movement. Zelen is also the founder of the widely acclaimed and cited website jihadiology.net, which is a clearinghouse for Sunni Jihadi primary source material and Philip Smith's influential Shia militia militancy column, Hezbollah Kavakade. Uh, thirdly, we have Dr. Daniel Moreau. Uh, Dr. Moreau is the executive director for the U.S.-Italy Global Affairs Forum in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Moreau has been a war correspondent for Italian Channel 5 TV News for 18 years, covering almost all conflict areas on the field, from Northern Ireland to Nicaragua, Somalia, Eritrea, Mozambique, Polisario, Middle East, uh, North Africa, and the list goes on. Um, in 2010, he has been invited to join the Center of Transatlantic Relation at uh, SAIS, John Hopkins University, in Washington, D.C., where he covered the Arab Spring on Northern Africa. Uh, fourthly, we have Dr. Michael Barak. Uh, Dr. Barak is a senior researcher at the Institute for Counterterrorism uh, of the ICT, of the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy at the Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Center. IDC Herzliya, and serves as the team leader of the Global Jihad and Jihadi Websites Monitoring Group. He also teaches in IDC courses on terrorism and Islamic, Islamic radical movements. Dr. Barak holds both an MA, a BA and an MA degree in Middle Eastern Studies and Arabic Language from Tel Aviv University. He has finished his PhD at the at the School of History in Middle Eastern and African Studies, Tel Aviv University. His PhD dissertation is concerned with Sufism in Wahhabi and Salafi polemic discourse in Egypt and the Mashriq between 1967 and 2001. Fifthly, we have Dr. Jacob Zen. Now, Mr. Jacob Zen is an analyst of African and Eurasian affairs in the Jamestown Foundation, United States of America. Uh, Mr. Zen was, comp um, was component leader under European Union technical assistance to Nigeria's evolving security challenges. Mr. Zen has provided testimony to the U.S. Congress on Boko Haram in 2013 and 2016, and has also provided briefings and lectures on Boko Haram and VNSA's trends in Africa. Uh, Zen holds a JD from Georgetown University Law Center where he, has a global law, where he was a global law scholar and a graduate certificate in Chinese and American affairs from John Hopkins, SAIS, 
Neijing University School of Advanced International Studies, where courses were taught in Mandarin. Finally, we have Mr. Jonathan Paris. Mr. Paris is currently senior advisor with the Chodov Group in London and in Washington. He's associate fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization at King's College London and a board member of the Global Diplomatic Forum in London. Paris has written several, uh, written several year long political, demographic, economic, and security studies on a diverse range of countries, including among the re rest, Sub Saharan Africa, U.S. relations, and the future of China in Africa. Mr. Paris was a Middle East Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York from 1994 to 2000. He is a graduate of Yale University, BA in Comparative, Poli uh, Comparative Political and Economic Systems, and Stanford Law School. He is a native of Beechwood, Ohio. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like that I'm sure. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to see here colleagues, my students, my former students, and other people. And what we are going to do during the uh, coming uh, two hours and a half or three hours, we are going to discuss issues that connected to Africa. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss the issues that connected to Africa within the global level and from the general overview into uh, entering inside uh, some topics in every uh, jihadi groups or uh, areas that we are uh, going to discuss. And I want to, to start the general overview uh, regarding the situation of, uh, on Africa soil. As you can see, this presentation was prepared by uh, Daniel and by me. And we analyze, uh, in general, the information about this uh, phenomenon. Three major things I want to say before entering into the uh, concept of Africa. There are three major trends that influence the situation on Africa soil. And this is the ongoing implications of the Arab Spring, meaning the situation that Arab Spring influenced what's going on in this field and uh, Af North Africa and other places was uh, has a big government and this has influenced the uh, global uh, jihad in these areas. The second uh, component that we can say in general influenced the situation on the ground, this is the uh, changes of the global jihad movement, the competition between uh, Akim, uh, between ISIS, and uh, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, in heat operations on Africa soil. Uh, a, a competition that connected to uh, a local support to uh, economic resources and to other uh, issues that uh, we have uh, in these areas. And on the other side, we have uh, a rising of uh, a lot of uh, a terrorist group, new local terrorist group that uh, uh, a, a arrived uh, during uh, a, this uh, a time. And the third issue that influenced the situation in, uh, on Africa soil was the counterterrorism operation. You can find out that the counterterrorism operation influenced the modus operandi and the behavior of this group on uh, Africa soil. This is the three major trends, if I need to analyze the uh, situation on uh, Africa. These are the three major trends that influence Africa soil. And we think that Africa became the next area of operation of the global jihadists, specifically compared to their situation on the Middle East and in other places. And it's not by coincidence that we have all these kinds of operations of this group on uh, Africa soil. Just trying to understand uh, and to look on the uh, jihad uh, in Africa, just major key events. Let's look at uh, the beginning of uh, uh, 2000, from 1998 until 2006. You can see that we have the establishment of organization in 2002 and 2006, El, El Shabab in 2006, Boko Haram in 2002, and then uh, the establishment of AQM, meaning the Al Qaeda front inside uh, a, a, on a Africa soil. This is the, uh, the second time that Al Qaeda Central operated outside the uh, Afghanistan area. The first one was in 2004 in Iraq. The second one was the, uh, in 2007 AQM 
in, uh, uh, on uh, Africa soil, and in 2009, it was Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So we see the, uh, the influence and the way that Al-Qaeda built uh, uh, itself during the years. In 2009, Boko Haram entered into the Chicago, uh, uh, Chicago period, being more uh, radical, more dangerous, operating uh, on the ground. In 2011, this was the uh, start of the uh, uh, Arab Spring. So what we see in the Arab Spring, entering of other groups like Ansara Sharia and other groups inside Libya and in uh, uh, Tunisia. And then what we see uh, involvement even on Sinai uh, in Egypt, the Ansar Bet el Magdas, uh, groups that were uh, operated and started their operations uh, on the ground. 2012, it was the years that was influenced by the uh, uh, operation that was carried out in Mali, in uh, Azwad, that was uh, uh, influenced by the operation of uh, uh, AQM and the uh, uh, French forces that uh, uh, interactions in Mali uh, also. What we can see during this time, El Shabab joined Al Qaeda, meaning Al Qaeda Central established more capabilities on Africa soil. And they accepted El Shabab after Bin Laden died because they didn't want to accept El Shabab before Bin Laden died. Meaning they were influence of this group on Africa soil was a huge uh, influence. As you can see, all the northern part of Africa was captured by uh, a jihadist that operated uh, on the ground. 2013, we have started the split from uh, AQM, El Murabitun split from AQM. 2014, this is the story of ISIS. 2014, we see uh, step after step, ISIS forces enter inside uh, a, a Africa soil, meaning a new competition emerge on the ground. Started in uh, uh, a Sinai, continue in Libya, and then by Boko Haram uh, apply, uh, apply uh, to uh, ISIS, so enjoy ISIS, so we have Africa between two major actors that are operating, global actors that are operating on uh, Africa soil. And what we have uh, uh, during this uh, uh, 2015 and 2016, the unification inside AQM operation and then an internal uh, tensions on Africa soil. Meaning if I just try to see and screen the situation on Africa from the late of the 90s until today, you see more and more actors enter into this field. The competition became uh, a huge competition between these people, and the competition translated into using violence. And that's what they uh, did, and this is uh, the major issue that we see on Africa. So this is before bringing in our friends from Hezbollah. And we will discuss our friend from Hezbollah maybe later on. So this is the situation on the ground on Africa. And you ask yourself, why Africa? Just looking at the uh, Muslim societies that are operating on Africa soil, it makes uh, a Muslim population, it makes uh, sense that this area is a very good area for recruitment. So it's not by coincidence that the tensions that they, all these kind of operations started in North Africa and from North Africa, it disseminated into Central Africa and if, if you want into uh, other places. We have a lot of conflict zone in uh, uh, areas of limited statehood, but we'll not discuss it in uh, 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 details. But what we need to understand that these areas give them the ability to flourish, to have an ability to build their capabilities on the ground. We have Western presence, meaning targets in their eyes, if you translate it from the other side, these are targets for kidnapping, for operation, for other issues. And we have a huge market of illegal uh, trade and international crime, because this is the base for uh, these kinds of operation. When you have this, and you are dealing with an organization that look for resources, this is a very nice place to find resources. Because every terrorist organization need money, need to gain money from this, so on Africa soil, they have also these uh, capabilities. Regarding international crime uh, 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 and Africa soil, I can say that West Africa uh, 
is a very, very convenient base for operation uh, of terrorist organization into international crime. And we discuss it a lot in our uh, uh, semesters with the uh, student regarding Africa is the bridge between Latin America and Europe. Latin America, drug industry, enter into West Africa and then smuggle into Europe or by the sea or through the, uh, 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 the land. And so when you have this opportunity, you find immediately the actors that are operating within these areas. Besides uh, a global jihadist, we have also Hezbollah, we have West African drug syndicates, and we have uh, a Latin American drug uh, cartels and all these people that are uh, involved in this uh, uh, operation. So there is a cooperation and collaboration between all these groups when it comes to money and when it comes to involvement in international crime and they do did, uh, these operations uh, 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 all the time. And there is also increasing trend uh, in uh, West Africa that they start to build uh, a capabilities for the drug industry uh, locally. Just you can see if you want to link all the, the things that I said regarding being Africa or West Africa being a station between Latin America to uh, Europe, you see here is the main route of the drug industry that started in Latin America, continue into West Africa and enter into the field of uh, uh, Europe and other uh, places. And global jihadists are deeply involved in this industry on the ground. Hezbollah uh, has a lot of uh, uh, capabilities on West Africa especially, and it's not by coincidence because uh, there are a huge diaspora of Lebanese on West Africa, and there are the capabilities to use these operations on the ground. So we have uh, a Hezbollah in West Africa, and uh, uh, since during the uh, years, we have also entrance of Hezbollah into Nigeria, and entrance of Hezbollah into Congo, and to other places uh, uh, in uh, uh, Africa. Uh, so uh, for Hezbollah, Africa is the base for operation. For the global jihadist, Africa is a hub that they can uh, have resources and carried out operations also. So now let's see the strategy of Al-Qaeda in uh, uh, Africa itself. If I see the Al-Qaeda strategy in general, that I try to uh, uh, look at in a different way than the, the, the uh, ISIS strategy, Al-Qaeda, like ISIS, want to establish Sharia law over the world, and this is something that within the Al-Qaeda uh, seven phases strategy, there is a strategy that uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, at the end of the day, will enable to establish the caliphate. Uh, ISIS established the caliphate, Ka uh, Al-Qaeda not, because Al-Qaeda is operating today in a different way, establishing local state, meaning emirate, Islamic emirate, and through the Islamic emirate, step by step, establishing the caliphate itself. So they have some strategies that are fit together to achieve this goal. This is the seven phases strategy. This is the thousand cut strategy based on homegrown and lone wolf. And this is another uh, strategy that promoted by Abu Masa Bessouri, the global Islamic resistance called, that equal today to what we uh, know uh, a lone wolf or a uh, lone wolf that supported by a virtual uh, lone wolf as we can say today. The, within the strategy of Al-Qaeda, they enter also the electronic jihad strategy, that this is part of their operation to uh, bring their uh, uh, capabilities inside uh, 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 Africa soil. One of the things that you will see later on, but I want to say it now, Al-Qaeda enter into the field of the DAWA operation, meaning operating within the public, because they want to recruit the public for their operation. And they have a huge debate after the uh, uh, Mali regarding how should, how, what is the way that they need to uh, deal with the uh, uh, local societies and how to bring them to this uh, issue. Regarding the military operation, it's very, very clear that this group uh, uh, has the uh, ideas of uh, a far enemy and the, the near enemy, and they have priorities between the far enemy and the near enemy on the ground, and this is something that we need to understand. 
from the uh, Al-Qaeda forum during the time that well, they carried out the attack on Mali and they captured a lot of areas in Mali. Within the Al-Qaeda forum there were uh, discussions and discourse that showed what is the general idea of Al-Qaeda uh, regarding Africa's soul. And you can see that what they have in their mind to use Mali as a base of operation to infiltrate into the other state meaning to gain more power on the ground inside uh, a, a on Africa soil. And it's not by coincidence that these discussions were discussed immediately after a Mali a operation. This is within the organization a, a, a agenda. And uh, just to understand that we are dealing with the organization that in the, Africa is the, in one of the targets, you can find out within the digital magazine of Al-Qaeda and afterward we'll see it also within the digital magazine of ISIS. Because everyone from them, for them, uh, Africa is a base of operation and they need to uh, find a way to uh, a, a operate on this land. By saying that, uh, I can say that what we see during the years within the strategy of Al-Qaeda on the ground, a lot of effort of unification of uh, a local uh, group into uh, Al-Qaeda. From the beginning, building the front on the, on the uh, Africa soil, and then trying to link local organization into Al-Qaeda. In, uh, <coughs> in this example, these are the Murabitun that was uh, a connected to a, a QM. Regarding modus operandi, I want to say some uh, a topics regarding modus operandi. I know that the, the international community was very surprised after ISIS carried out his strategic offensive. They said, we see a, 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 a huge a operation that carried out by a GRD group using a convoy, hundreds of uh, a, a vehicles to carry out an operation. We saw it before on Africa soil. It was in Libya, it was by El Shabaab in Somalia, meaning on Africa soil, this local group was not operated as a small group that carried out low attack, low, uh, a, by using five or six people. They used hundreds of people to carry out this kind of attack. We see this phenomenon on Africa before. Why this phenomenon of Africa in, on Africa soil changed? Because the counter-terrorism operation. So after the counter-terrorism operation that was carried out on Africa soil, the local group started to carry out a very low intensity warfare, meaning going back to the guerrilla operation, going back to a other uh, a kind of operation, not carried out a huge uh, a attack. This was the way that Al-Qaeda they operate on the ground. But during the years, after the competition of ISIS, we see a mix, we call it a mix modus operandi. So on one hand, you see people that are carried out in attacks by using lone wolf. On the other hand, you will find out in Libya, uh, an operation that carried out between armies, two uh, armies regarding the attack on Syria and in other places around the world. Meaning the situation, the modus operandi is changed according the uh, a policies that was carried out against these groups. So if I just put four places to see how things operate, see the first one in uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, the, the beginning when Boko Haram started to operate, it took control over a lot of places of Nigeria. You see AQM that carried out an operation in uh, Mali and took control over a lot of areas in Mali. You see El Sabab in Somalia, that they have a peak of their operations on Somaliland, on Somalia, and you see Ansar Sharia uh, in uh, a, a Libya. When it changed, when the counter-terrorism operation started, they have lots of territories and they uh, emphasize on low intensity warfare. So you can see the situation of Boko Haram when they were under pressure, they pledged an alliance with ISIS. The situation of AQM, when they were under the pressure of the France, uh, uh, French uh, uh, soldiers, they changed the organizational structure. They went outside and started to operate differently uh, uh, in Mali. In, uh, uh, in El Shabaab in Somalia, they caused an internal dispute within the organization. And you know, in El Shabaab in Somalia, if you are not uh, uh, operating according to the leader, 
you need to be killed by the leader, not by your enemy. This is the uh, uh, situation that we face on the ground. And regarding Ansara Sharia, in, in Libya, in the entrance of ISIS into this area caused a huge competition between the two on these uh, uh, areas of uh, uh, operation. I have enough time so I can talk. And nobody stopped me here in this uh, panel. Okay, so by seeing the uh, low intensity conflict or low intensity warfare in this area, if you remember it was the uh, uh, a, a text that was carried out uh, a, in uh, Kenya in 2011. It was the attack that was carried out on, uh, a, on Amana in 2013. And it was the attack that was carried out in Mali in 2015. Meaning, long attack, small attack, but the impact was bigger than the lower of the attack because the impact was regionally and globally, although they carried out uh, a not uh, a very uh, a small attack by using modus operandi. For Al-Qaeda themselves, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, it was very important, the attack that was carried out on Amana gas facilities. So they published a study about their attack because they want to disseminate the knowledge to their people. So they established a study, and this study, if you uh, want it, is within the uh, GRD website, GRD forum, then you can find it. Also, most of it translated uh, into English by our team here, that this is the jihadi website monitoring uh, a group team. The uh, attack that was carried out in one place that took more than three days influenced global community. And this is the way that they need to uh, carry out the attack. So this group, on el leaders in on Africa soil, see look at, look around themselves and see w what is the influence of the attack that was carried out by the lone wolf of ISIS. Started to promote the ideas and the speeches, and to push their people also to carry out lone wolf attack in different parts around the world. Not only by Al Qaeda Central, not only by ISIS, also by the groups that are operating on a, a Africa soil. So what we can see uh, that, uh, as I mentioned before, it was uh, entrance of Al Qaeda into the field of recruitment, the masses. And it was uh, the changes, in my view, the main changes was in 2012 when they entered into Mali and they have problems with the local communities. So since then, they establish a concept and they establish a strategy that enable them to gain the support of the people. So they say we need to find the ways to reach the people that are not Muslims from the early days. They are not Muslims like us. So you will find out that they changed the strategy. It was published within the speeches of uh, a, a Zawahiri. It was published even afterward in 2015 strategy of Safe Adel that was uh, uh, published in the uh, uh, Jihadi website. That Safe Adel said very clear, besides guerrilla warfare that we need to carry out, what we need to find and to build our infrastructure to bring in the uh, local society to uh, work with us. And Safe Will Adel, if you remember, is one of the founders of Al Qaeda that is still alive. Okay, he's still out of the uh, uh, jail. And he, uh, uh, by his history, he was a military personnel. So he understand what is the need of military personnel to bring military personnel into uh, Al-Qaeda rank. And this is the reason why he said we need to recruit military personnel. One of the capabilities, one of the reasons for the capabilities of ISIS that it's based on military personnel from Saddam Hussein army. Okay, so you have their capabilities to carry out an operation. And Al-Qaeda, they uh, understand it from the beginning. So on the ground, you will find out the translations of these uh, strategies into operations on the ground. So if you gather information about Al-Shabaab operations on the ground in Somalia, you will find out that Al-Shabaab is deeply involved in operation with the local society. We're trying to find and build an agreement with tribes. We're trying to support the needy. We'll try to enter into an uh, uh, education system and bring people to El Shabab uh, group. So there is not only in the level of the uh, strategy, the strategy translated into operations on the ground. And it's meaning that we have not only one front to counter, we have two fronts to counter, the front of the Dawa and the front of the Jihad. 
Just looking another uh, angle to the ISIS, and I will do it uh, uh, very short uh, regarding ISIS. ISIS strategy on Africa soil, based on the concept of ISIS, that they were under pressure inside the center of ISIS, so they tried to build a secondary center in different parts around the world. And they tried to build themselves in ability that they have a survivability after the uh, uh, a, a campaign against ISIS uh, a, on uh, Syria soil and uh, Iraq soil will end it. ISIS is in a hardship strategic situation. If from this part, it need to open new areas of operation. So like, if I see ISIS operation, this is the ISIS center, meaning the primary center of ISIS, what ISIS did, he opened secondary center of operation on, uh, a, a, in Libya, in Nigeria, Boko Haram that uh, changed his uh, a connection, in Egypt, in Sinai, and if you want to, in other places. But ISIS have three circles. One's primary center of operation, second, secondary center of operation, and the third, inspire region. People that are inspired by ISIS through the uh, uh, internet in different parts around the world, in Europe, in the United States, everywhere. So this is the way that ISIS uh, operates, but on Africa soil, it has the ability to build capabilities. Why? Because all the things that we described before. So on Africa soil, it became very important for uh, ISIS for operation. So Africa entered into ISIS strategy. And ISIS started to establish capabilities on Africa, specifically in Libya. Because the situation in Libya was a chaotic situation. So it enabled ISIS to send and to, dis to uh, uh, influence Arab foreign fighters from Tunis, from other places, to come to Libya, not to uh, uh, come to Syria. Because they want to establish another field of operation. So you will find out a lot of uh, uh, foreigners from the uh, Africa soil that enter into uh, uh, this area of uh, uh, Libya. And what is important in our eyes when it comes to the uh, uh, story of ISIS, that it, they change the messages all the time. And the messages were Africa became very important. Not only remaining and expanding, also operating on Africa soil. And it's not by coincidence that they started to publish information regarding Africa on DABIC, on the digital magazine of ISIS that they know that they will influence other people around the world. But there is another agenda within the ISIS operation on Africa soil because Africa was the gate to Europe. So if you are operating in Libya, if you are operating along the Africa uh, northern uh, border, this is the gate to Europe, not only for smuggling uh, drugs, also for smuggling activists. So in their eyes, Africa is also is a, is a very important area for operation because it can influence also the European arena. So what we can say regarding uh, uh, the modus operandi of ISIS, it's a mixed warfare. On one hand, high intensity warfare that we see in Libya, more than some thousands of uh, activists that operating on Libya soil and Boko Haram operation. After they were under counter terrorism of, uh, uh, attacks, they uh, uh, promoted the message and the, their strategy was shift into remaining and expanding, meaning let's build uh, and establish capabilities uh, on Libya and then expand these capabilities into other uh, places. They uh, uh, started to carry out low intensity conflict because they were under this kind of uh, uh, a, a counter uh, a campaign that we see it uh, very good uh, uh, carried out on Libya soil from being a con controlling a lot of uh, a territories on Libya, they are now in a very short uh, a place. They will change the way that they are deployed and they continue with their operation on the ground. So they, what they need to do and what they are doing all the time, they are promoting uh, a recruitment messages. And they are promoting recruitment messages not to uh, a people that diaspora that are far away from this area, from neighboring countries. So for them to, if you are from Tunisia, from Algeria, from these areas, 
please come to, uh, uh, to us. And they use a lot of uh, uh, technical issues to promote these uh, 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 recruitment messages. Local languages, narrow casting, all the, the things that we just described regarding uh, a, a recruitment. On the other side, they carried out uh, a, a psychological attack, I can say, it, against El Shabab because they published a lot of stories uh, against El Shabab because they want to be in a situation that El Shabab members will they declare their uh, plans to uh, their, their uh, twice. So if I took the two uh, groups, Al Qaeda versus the Islamic State in Africa, and I put them in one uh, slide, I can say that Al Qaeda short-term goal is to establish local Emirates on Africa, meaning going step by step, not capturing all the territories, building uh, and establishing local Emirates that controlled by this group on Africa soil, and how to do it to gain support with the local groups meaning agreement with the local groups and operating within the society and trying to unify local groups and the society itself. And on the other side, trying to promote uh, a, a, <coughs> a messages that counter ISIS agenda and ISIS uh, propagation. ISIS on the other side, the uh, short-term goal of ISIS it's to define and to establish the, uh, another wilayat, another sector of the, uh, uh, of the caliphate inside uh, uh, Africa soil. How to do it? Using force, to gain control over territories by using force, enforcing Sharia, not by talking with the locals and trying to convince them, enforcing Sharia with uh, uh, force and uh, violence. And there is a competition uh, uh, regarding ISIS, there is a competition from Al Qaeda, so they try to promote a very high profile uh, media uh, campaign. If I want to sum up what I said until now, you came to the summary. I see. Okay. If I want to sum up uh, what I said uh, until now uh, regarding future trends uh, uh, in Africa, I can uh, accept what I heard yesterday on the panel the day before. Nobody can predict what will happen in these areas uh, uh, regarding specifically radical uh, uh, jihadists. But you can, uh, uh, you can say that Africa in the coming years will, be, will stay a very important uh, part within the global jihadist uh, uh, agenda and within the global jihadist uh, uh, strategy. And this is something that we need to bear in our mind. The, uh, in my view, the uh, scary uh, uh, issue or scenario is when ISIS and Al-Qaeda will work together. And nobody can say that they will never work together. This is, in my view, the most problematic scenario that we can find out uh, uh, regarding Africa. And with this, thank you very much. I finished my presentation, and I want my friend to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm tasked with uh, talking about Libya. Um, and I think there are three ways we could look at what's going on in Libya now. Um, in terms of uh, the jihadi movement uh, specifically. One is the current status of the Islamic State. Uh, the second one is sort of the state of play for other jihadi groups. And then lastly is the foreign fighters that have gone to Libya and what might happen now that uh, the Islamic State's territory has more or less been um, uh, taken back by a variety of forces over the last year or so. So in terms of the Islamic State itself, they don't really control any territory anymore in Libya. Maybe a neighborhood in Sirte, but more or less um, Bunyan al-Marsus, which is the local force that's fighting them in Sirte currently, has slowly taken neighborhood by neighborhood and eventually they'll take the last one as well. Um, as a result, I think that there are a lot of questions about what will happen next for the Islamic State in Libya. I don't think anybody really has a good answer. 
um, unless you're a leader in the group itself, especially since they had already previously been kicked out of Derna um, in June 2015. Um, so they don't have as many places to go, at least in terms of the bigger cities that are more well known. Um, there's still some presence of them fighting on the outskirts of Derna, but uh, the local groups there are fully against ISIS, so I don't think that they have much of a chance to try and get back into that city. Um, they also are still fighting here and there in Benghazi, but they're not the main fighting force in Benghazi. Um, that's Majlis Shura Thuwar Benghazi, um, uh, as well as the fact that Haftar's forces continue to put pressure on um, uh, Majlis Shura Thuwar Benghazi, as well as the Islamic State inside of uh, that city. As a result, you know, it'll just continue to play out in that regard. I'm unsure that you're going to see anything necessarily on the same level of partial control of some neighborhoods in Derna in uh, early 2015, or even what we've seen in CERT um, in the latter half of 2015 and so far in 2016. Um, with that said, uh, there are some potential scenarios of, of what we could see. Um, when the Islamic State announced itself in Libya, it noted that it had three so-called provinces inside of Libya. One is Tarablis, uh, another one is Al Barqa, and the third one is Fizan. Uh, Fizan is in the southern parts of Libya. We haven't heard that much of, about Wilayat Fizan, in part because they haven't really had that large of a presence there. Um, they have uh, taken responsibility for one attack there but it was like more than a year ago. But now that they've been kicked out of CERT, the question is, is will they regroup themselves in southern Libya now? Some are looking at cities like uh, Bini Walid. Um, some see it as a place that had a lot of Gaddafi loyalists as well, similar to CERT, and therefore could be an area where they can try and exploit grievances that individuals might have in that regard. Um, Another angle is that uh, in some of the videos that the Islamic State has put out in Libya, they've directed their messages towards both the Tuaregs and Tobu in southern Libya, and as a consequence, it's possible that they might try and link up with some entities in, in those areas as well, though there's not that much good information publicly, at least about the extent of any connection. So I don't want to speculate, but it's, it's a possibility. Um, <coughs> and then... On top, and then besides that, I, th I think po probably the most likely scenario uh, that we'll see is that they'll probably just hang out in sort of the border region between Libya, Algeria, and Niger um, and sort of wait until they see any other potential opportunities to do something or plan terrorist attacks from that location um, since it appears that uh, that they, you know, no longer are in control of any territory. Um, in terms of other jihadi groups inside of Libya, um, uh, overall, you know, AQIM has a presence, but they don't really talk about it publicly, so there's not much that can be said beyond the fact that people know that they're hanging out in southern Libya. They've planned attacks from there. We know the Inaminis attack in Algeria was planned in uh, there, Bil Mukhtar's hung out in places like Ubari. Um, uh, but in terms of an organizational presence and talking about what they're actually doing there, um, there really isn't that much about it that's going on publicly, though it's, it's certainly possible that they're providing guidance and advice to some of the other groups that are more overt in Benghazi and Darna. So I'll briefly talk about those. Um, in Benghazi, I mentioned Majlis Shura Thuwar Benghazi. Um, it's a collection of a bunch of different Islamist organizations. One of them includes Ansar al-Sharia in Libya, um, which is more or less a front group for al-Qaeda in Libya, um, following the Arab uprisings in Libya. Um, and the head military commander from Majlis Shura Thuwar Benghazi is originally from Ansar al-Sharia in Libya. So you could tell that they have some level of influence within this organization. Um, but one of the things to note about groups like this, as well as other battalions in Libya, unlike, say, the Islamic State, is that they're very localized. Um, and as a consequence, I don't see that many scenarios where these types of groups 
would be interested in really imposing themselves outside of sort of their general locale of operation. Part of this is a consequence of how Gaddafi ruled the country. Um, people are mistrustful of anybody outside of their city. I mean, is, you know, the whole uh, joke about Libya is that it's a series of city-states, not really a country. Um, so as a result, um, you know, I think in terms of the Libyan scenario, you need to take it on a city-by-city -city basis when, it's, when we're not talking about the Islamic State. Um, and then the other places in Derna where Majlis Shura al-Mujahideen Derna is operating, uh, again, they're sort of a cutout of Al-Qaeda, though there isn't a lot of great uh, public information about it. Part of this is the fact that Al-Qaeda does this on purpose. They want to sort of subvert our knowledge and information about the connections that they have with particular individuals and groups as part of their broader strategy we've seen, especially in the last five years or so. Um, you know, we've, we've uh, you know, the most prominent case obviously is in Syria, I would argue, with uh, Jabhat al-Nusra now being Jabhat al-Fatah al-Sham. Um, but we also see it with uh, AQAP in Yemen under names like Ansar al-Shri in the Arabian Peninsula or the Sons of Hadramaut and so on and so forth. So this is sort of in line with a broader Al-Qaeda strategy that we've seen over the last few years in trying to really embed themselves in the roots of these insurgencies locally and to try and mask their influence so it doesn't appear that they're dominating or monopolizing. Um, a lot of this is as a consequence of lessons learned from the failures that happened in Iraq last decade. Um, uh, and as a result, they've sort of changed tunes because of that. Um, so uh, again, there's still a lot of questions about what will happen though. Um, I suspect it'll just be status quo in many places um, in Benghazi. In Derna, it's a little more advanced, I think. Um, you see the group there, they're trying to initiate public works projects, having uh, development come in from outside. Um, uh, so the question is whether they'll be successful in this. Um, it's, it's not really, uh, it'll, it'll be interesting model to see whether they're successful or not. Um, it's obviously different than the Islamic State's approach where it's really top down, we're doing everything where there, where Majlis Shura uh, al Mujahideen and Derna uh, is more or less trying to get others to help them out because they know that they can't do it alone, which might be a more sustainable path, um, uh, which would make it even more difficult then later on to potentially eject Al Qaeda if, if they do have a large presence there. Um, and then the last topic, uh, I don't want to keep it too long since I know people are probably more interested in question and answers and back and forth. Um, is potential blowback from foreign fighters who have joined up with ISIS in Libya. Um, uh, Libya has the largest foreign fighter mobilization outside of Iraq and Syria. Um, I would say based off of open source and my own sort of looking through information um, publicly that there are up to 2,000 foreign fighters that have gone to <coughs> Libya. Um, over the past couple of years, especially since I IS has gained a presence there in uh, spring 2014 or so. Um, uh, they come from 29 different countries, so it's nowhere near the level of, say, Iraq and Libya, which has more than 100 nations represented. Um, but the thing with Libya is that more than 50% of them are Tunisians. So it's not like it's that diverse in the same way of you know, there's small segmentations from e each nation. It's like, there's a huge amount of Tunisians and then from there, there's a little from everybody else. Um, that being said, uh, there's probably a relatively, e if you take out the Tunisians, there's a relatively even split between uh, people from North Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. Um, uh, and this is all based off of me counting it publicly, so it's likely that there are more people involved. You just can't confirm it because they're not necessarily going to be like, hey, I'm here in Libya. Um, they they want to uh, not show that necessarily. Um, and then under that bracket uh, is, is uh, individuals from the Sahel and West Africa. And then under that is a small amount from East Africa 
and then there's uh, negligible numbers from North America and South Asia. Um, uh, in terms of looking forward, one of the things we always see with these foreign fighter mobilizations is that after a group is routed or they're kicked out of particular territory, um, a lot of individuals decide to go home or to some other war zone or locale to try and do something there. Um, obviously, we've seen that in the case of Iraq and Syria with everything that's gone on in North Africa, everything that's gone on in Western Europe, um, thing, a few things here and there in South Asia, in Southeast Asia. So one of the things that's interesting to me about uh, the Libyan case is that we've seen individuals from particular countries getting involved in foreign fighting that really haven't had a history of it in the past. They might have been involved in local jihadi activism, um, uh, but they never really were connected, broadly speaking. Um, so as a consequence, I think um, some of these countries might have uh, you know, some interesting debates going forward on potentially what to do with these individuals when they come home or the potential for them to proselytize and recruit new people since they have that experience now in Libya which provides them sort of uh, this narrative or ability to project that they're these great heroes that went and fought jihad against the infidels and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> obviously the biggest worry I have is Tunisia. Um, it's not surprising since more than 50% of the foreign fighters are in Libya and they're right next to each other. We've already seen a large group of Tunisians that were in Libya attempt to take over the city of Bin Gardane um, earlier this year uh, in <coughs> February and March. Um, and the fact is that there are thousands of Tunisians that were in Syria as well, so combined together, um, uh, it's just a ticking time bomb in my opinion. Um, though I will say I got to give credit to the Tunisian security forces uh, since they have, you know, considering the number of people who have been involved and the number of attacks that has actually occurred, it's been relatively low when you think about it. Um, so it's possible that they might be able to continue to stave this off because if you look at the local Tunisian press, they're arresting probably dozens of people a week. Um, but with anything, there's not 100% security, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw another attack there. Um, another interesting case for me uh, is Sudan. Most people don't usually think too much about Sudanese getting involved in the jihadi movement. Obviously, we know about bin Laden and all the Arabs that were hanging out there in the mid-1990s. Um, but what's interesting is we've seen many Sudanese going to Libya and joining up with ISIS. Um, and many of them were actually suicide bombers there. Um, and related to that is that uh, some of the foreign fighters that went to Libya were actually going through Sudanese territory. So that's another angle as well in terms of these facilitation logistics networks and what that might could potentially mean inside of Sudan going forward. <coughs> uh, another country that's interesting to me, at least that, or at least that jumps out, is um, Senegal. Um, you know, historically, I haven't really seen Senegalese getting involved in these types of activities. Um, there really hasn't been any terrorism there. Um, you know, the government has always talked about how it's a unique case and that it's not necessarily similar to a lot of places. But the reality is, is that, at least open source wise, we've seen like 20 to 30 people go. Possibly it's more, but again, we can't track every single person. Um, but because it's such a new phenomenon and the fact that the government might not be taking it quite as seriously is possible that that could lead to greater issues. Um, and I'm saying this in the context of what we've seen in the past with other governments where people are like, oh, this doesn't happen here, we don't have a problem until they actually see an attack happening. Um, so I'm not saying anything's gonna necessarily happen, but I would argue that it's something to look at. Um, Another interesting thing is sort of the Islamic State's connections in East Africa, even though not that many people have gone to Libya. One of the things that we've seen is that IS in Libya sort of acted as a hub for their operations in Africa, as noted in the last presentation. Um, we've seen that with their outreach to Boko Haram in Nigeria, but also them trying to siphon off members from Al-Shabaab 
um, in Somalia and the Horn of Africa in general. And one of the things uh, we've seen is that uh, some of these guys that have pledged Bayat to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi that are from Somalia and Kenya have gone to Libya to get skills and train and then come back home to try and incubate that area. Of course, it's not a large issue at this juncture, in part because al-Shabaab has pretty much tried to extinguish any threat to them um, from the Islamic State. Um, but it is a, an interesting case that could potentially bear more fruit going forward for them, especially if people are returning home with new skills. So I would keep an eye out for some of these individuals that have possibly coming back from Kenya and Somalia. Um, and then lastly, um, there isn't great details about this, but there have been reports of it, which is just interesting to me, is that there have been a number of reports of people from Ghana that have gone to Libya. I've never heard of people from Ghana previously being involved in jihadi activism, so the fact that there are some reports of people there, um, you know, is interesting. Uh, I don't know much about Ghana. It's not really my area of research. I focus mainly on the Arab world, so I don't want to get into that specifically. But again, it's just just pointing out something that popped out at me that's of interest. For, and for those that are from the region or people that focus more on West Africa, like uh, Jacob, you know, it's areas that might be fruitful to look into more in the future in terms of what's going on as you see things spreading more and you know just recently the Islamic State claimed their first attack you know sort of in Burkina Faso so you see that something some stuff is going on pa part of this could possibly be because people have left Libya after them losing territory and they're trying to extend themselves elsewhere now and exploiting areas that might not have the same level of security um, or experience dealing with these issues but um, you know, I think with Libya and these foreign fighters, at this point, there's not a lot of concrete answers. We're sort of like in this transitionary period between sort of this spike and now this lull between what happens next. Um, and as a result, uh, I think one of the things we could do is just follow what's going on. But at least we could sort of lay out the trajectory of where we see things going and sort of what's occurred and therefore hopefully that will provide some answers in the future of um, what's going to happen inside of Libya but also what consequences might have broadly speaking more in the sub-Saharan zone of Africa. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Velin. I want to invite uh, Daniel to uh, discuss the topics of Tunisia and Algeria. And if you have questions regarding Ghana, people in this room can help you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Adzani, for inviting me. We have just put a map to try to explain myself. You see... You can break your neck like this. <laughs> <laughs> I do this. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> Algeria, as you know, is the biggest uh, country in Africa, and uh, Tunisia is one of the smallest, and Italy is just very close <coughs> to both of these <coughs> countries, historically and geographically. If you look at the map, uh, you probably see between Valletta in Tunisia, the small island of Lampedusa, which is 70 miles from Tunisia, 100 kilometers. And is on the African shelf, not on the European. So it's so easy to interact between this area, Algeria and Tunisia and Italy. Historically, as Professor Azani said, you go up and down <coughs> this area since centuries. <coughs> was uh, trade, criminals, whatever. When the Arab Spring started, I was in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, one of the questions was why Algeria was so stable. I mean, everyone was uh, 
happy to see the Arab countries, uh, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, and so, uh, in some way, <coughs> doing a kind of revolution. Algeria was ultra stable. As you probably know, Algeria lost about 150,000 people in the 90s. So in some way, the population has still a fresh memory of what happened with <coughs> Gia and, uh, say, Islamist fighters. Second, Algeria is still under the control of the old generation of the FLN. The president is 79, 80 years old, but he is de facto incapacitated, is uh, practically unable to, to control the country, but the leadership is still from the ultra old generation in a country where the average age of the population is 27 years, 0.8. So is an ultra young country with an ultra old generation. It reminds me, and probably Professor Azzani, of the Chernienko in Soviet Union situation, where really uh, the old guys were ultra corrupted, because uh, one of the big problems is that the country is super rich, uh, but the population is super poor. You ask me as an old generation? Old generation, Chernienko, Andropov, Okay. And so that was a gerontocratic power where a lot of money is, in fact, in the Swiss banks, uh, is more than $150 billion stuck in the Swiss bank or in the private account or public account and is not invested in the country. So you have a, an extremely unhappy young population with an extremely uh, authoritarian regime where the police, the army, the intelligence service is really keeping the country under a kind of terror situation. Unable to control the territory because you see from uh, Mauritania, Mali, Niger, Libya and in part Tunisia, the country is, is practically impossible to control the country. Also, you have the huge area of the Tuareg here that crosses this way from Libya, Niger, Mali. And you have to remember that when Gaddafi was around, uh, I went to visit the southwest of Libya, and there was a kind of pact between Gaddafi and the Tuareg population. <laughs> I let you control the territory. You uh, don't make trouble for the uh, Tripoli government. So is uh, something similar to what I saw in Mogadishu, where if you wanted to be escorted, you had to pay $1,000 per day to people that if you didn't pay, will kidnap you, period. So they are exactly the same people that now are, were not under the <coughs> agreement with the Gaddafi, the Tripoli government, that are uh, totally in control of the territory. If you look also to Tinduf, where the Polisario Front is based, uh, I have been there also covering <coughs> the uh, Sahrawi uh, War of Independence. It's shocking because you are in the middle of nowhere and only the local, the native, can understand where it's possible to find the water in the middle of nowhere. So there is no army, no satellite, nothing uh, able to control this area. And Algeria is basically a country, especially in some areas like Kabylia, out of control. And this is also why uh, Professor Azzani uh, speaks about uh, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, uh, ISIS, and so you can go up and down, in and out of this area quite easily. So the concept of border in this area is really out of. So the, um, what is interesting is that uh, Algeria uh, was very conservative vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Arab Spring, like Italy. 
And I asked myself why the two countries were so conservative vis-a-vis -vis Gaddafi, for instance, or Ben Ali. Because uh, uh, we get gas, oil, and security. So we, we Italian, didn't care about the human rights or whatever of Libya or any other country because we are so close uh, that also when Gaddafi expelled the 20,000 remaining Italian people in the 70s, the same day we deliver tanks to Gaddafi. So we were saving the population, the Italian community, and selling tanks to Gaddafi. We saved Gaddafi many times, by the way, by internal threat. So uh, in exchange, we got gas and oil. And this was the problem with France, <coughs> and in part with Britain. You see on tomorrow news uh, about Cameroon uh, that was uh, considered guilty with Sarkozy of having uh, uh, over, over thrown Gaddafi. And the narrative is the French were trying to get to the gas, uh, the oil of Libya, uh, at the expenses of the Italian, mainly, because we are the main partner of Libya. So Algeria, and if you look at the history of Tunisia, when uh, the autocrat, of the dictator, or President Bourguiba in uh, Tunisia started to age. Uh, the Italian prime minister went to Algiers and found an agreement with the Algerian president to uh, have uh, Bourguiba out of power. Ben Ali was put, and this is in the history book of the uh, uh, former director of the Italian intelligence service uh, that the Italian Algerian uh, team uh, convinced the doctors, the medical doctors to declare uh, Bourguiba unfit to govern and they choose Ben Ali. The French were very upset <coughs> not because they wanted to keep Bourguiba in the in power, but they had another candidate. Everyone was clear that Bourguiba was not able to control the country anymore. But you have to remember that Bourguiba was for, for many years the father of the country, of the independence and so, and was considered more French than French. And this is a very interesting point. The country has been modernized in such a shocking way that great part of the population was not in favor of this. The country is very conservative, like the south of Italy. The mentality is similar. The father was in command and whatever. But they got the uh, personal statute in, statute in 1956. Uh, they got divorce, abortion, before the French and the, uh, the, the Italian women. So you have in some way a country which is under the Czech of the Algerian, the uh, Italian, and the French. The ultra-modernized area on the coast uh, is totally different from Gafsa and the interior, which is a, a middle age, in some way, condition, where all the travel for the government generally comes because it's underdeveloped, there is no money, people are illiterate, while on the coast, you, you may say you are in the south of Europe in some way. So at some point, when Ben Ali was thrown out, this kind of enada the, that the Americans consider kind of Christian Democrats of Italy, so a good uh, Islamist, uh, moderate, and so, they took power in a country, uh, power in a country where uh, the police didn't have the experience to deal with terrorism. They just had the experience without any, any uh, experience with popular demonstration and so. They were totally untrained for this new situation where in some way pluralism and so went on. The problem is that Tunisia didn't get the promised help from Europe and from America, no money 
to help them, the economy, to improve. So they found themselves in some way alone. And what happened is that when Enada, uh, that was in government, saw what happened in Egypt to the uh, brotherhood, the Muslim brotherhood, and second pillar, the women that for 40, 50 years had a lot of rights in the Burgiba model said no when another tried to change the constitution, putting the women of Tunisia in a kind of complementary position. You have to imagine that in Tunis you find a woman as a taxi driver that you don't find in Palermo, for instance. I mean, the uh, level of education of the uh, Tunisian women is very, very high. So to conclude, you have a, a country which is, in my opinion, is not a success story for the Americans. It's not a success story of the Obama administration. In fact, it's more, in some way, a success story of the Tunisian people, but is still extremely destabilized. And Algeria is a big question mark, because as soon as the old generation of the FLN uh, ultra-corrupted people will die, will pass away. No one knows what will happen to this space more than a country. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And I want to invite... Uh, Okay, but it will be in our next presentation on Africa, meaning next year, next year, not this year, next year. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Michael, please. <laughs> but you're right. Michael, prepare the map specifically for you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for coming for this session. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been tasked to talk about Akim uh, activity in uh, about Akim activity, and uh, as you see by the title, Akim, I call it this title, res resurgence. Akim is back and in big time, uh, and especially after the defeat in uh, 2013, when the French troops invaded, uh, uh, expelled the Mujahideen, the Islamists from uh, Mali. Uh, Al-Qaeda managed to uh, having a tremendous resilience and uh, recovery from uh, the defeat. So um, actually, Akim has expanded to new territories, um, com uh, established new allies and strengthened the ties with all the allies, uh, recruited more fighters and actually has become a major power in the Sahel and the Sahara. So the Sahel is a transition zone uh, between North Africa to uh, Sub-Sahara. And it's like from the west edge, from the, uh, let's say, Senegal, from uh, the Mediterranean till the east edge um, uh, near uh, Eritrea. So as you can see, for example, uh, in this slide, Akim has succeeded to expand to further territories in Mali. If in 2013 it was concentrated in the north of Mali, and the uh, Islamists like to call it Azawad, now today, in 2016, we can see that uh, Akim has uh, expanded and has an influence in south and central Mali, thanks to cooperation with uh, local Islamist uh, organization, which I will elaborate the discussion later. Since the end of 2015, Akim succeeded to carry out quality sophisticated military operations against Western targets in the region, particularly in the Sahel, carried out by well-trained fighters. So by this slide you can see uh, there is an increase by the operation, military operations of Akim 
uh, in 2016 it's very clear. Uh, for ex uh, to mention, on t for example, in, tw in uh, 20 November 2015, Al Murabitun organization, which is led by Al Mukhtar, uh, a union of two offshoots belongs to Akim, attacked the luxury Radisson Blue Hotel in Bamako, Mali. Uh, on 15 January 20, excuse me, uh, 2016, Akim attacked the splendid hotel and Cappuccino Cafe in Ouagadougou, I hope that I uh, spell it correct, Burkina Faso, and on the same day, the milit militants, Akim's members, attacked a police convoy and kidnapped an elderly Australian couple in the north of the country. So Akim shares the same goals and the ideology of Al-Qaeda organization, the mother organization, meaning expel expelling Western presence from Muslim lands, in the case of Akim, this means targeting uh, French troops uh, in North Africa and the Sahel, overthrowing secular uh, local regimes, especially the Algerian regime, and establishing Islamic Emirates that eventually will unite into a caliphate. Uh, okay, so, and deploying, of course, the Sharia law. And before, before I will elaborate a discussion on, Ak on Akim's strategy, and its efforts of recruiting more fighters to entrench, I will refer briefly to Akim Strasher that you will have an, will have an idea about uh, how it works. So first, we should remember that Akim, as I mentioned, is an official branch of Al-Qaeda organization which pledge, pledged uh, an allegiance to Sheikh Ayman al-Zawahiri. Originally, it was formed in Algeria as Al-Jama'at al-Salafiyya lil dawah wal qital or the Salafist group for preaching and combat. And in 2007, uh, it changed the name to Akim. Uh, it is believed that the current Akim strategic leadership is based in the mountains regions of Kabalie to the east of Algiers, where the ethnic Berber population is engaged in an ancient struggle, struggle with the central government for more autonomy. So the central leadership of Akim consists of, as looking look on the slide, the Emir is Drukdel, uh, Abu Musa Abed al-Wadud uh, Drukdel, and before he, he was uh, the leader of Akim, he was a regional commander uh, in the Algerian Salafist group for pre preaching and, and combat, and thanks to his efforts, he managed to uh, having uh, acceptance, acceptance from uh, Osama bin Laden to join to uh, Al-Qaeda. So as you can see, uh, beneath the Emir, we have the Council of uh, Notables, which is supervises, strategizes, and guides the group in the region. Abu Ubaida Ali Nabi is the head of the Council of Notables, and it includes uh, 15 members. And this guy is uh, considered one of the powerful people in the organization. And I will speak why Sahara region is also important. It's very powerful in the, in the eyes of uh, Akim. We have the Shura Council, which consists of 14 members, and we have uh, about uh, seven committees, uh, including those that are in charge of the military, the media, and foreign relations. And you see, in the media committee, we have El Andalus Media Outlet. This is the official uh, 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 platform of uh, media platform of Akim. So today, Akim operations have been divided into two sectors of Emirates, as the group officially called them. So we have the central region, in, which includes northern Algeria and Tunisia. In Tunisia, uh, okay, in Tunisia, uh, Akim branch is Uqaba Ben Nafi Battalion, which includes several hundred uh, warriors. Uh, in August, for example, the recent attack in was in August uh, 29. It has claimed an ambush on Tunisian soldiers in Kasserin uh, government. The second uh, sector is the Sahara region, which was created in 2009. includes northern Mali, Niger, Mauritania, and Libya. Since 2013, the Emir of the Sahara region has been Yahya Abu El Amam, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, and he has played a key role in Akim's ongoing terrorist activities, including the killing of U.S. national Christopher Leggett in Mauritania in June, uh, in June uh, 2009, and the killing of French national Michel Germano in Niger in July 2010. 
So the Sahara region is considered to be a very important terrain for Akim. This is because of its, its a very extensive area. Uh, and Akim members can cross this region uh, freely. Uh, and because it's used also as a central route for smuggling of weapons, drugs, and human beings. So this leads me to refer to Akim uh, financial channels. Uh, so kidnapping tourists, diplomats, journalists, and humanitarian uh, activities for ransom is the main source of revenue for Akim. Uh, since 2008, Akim and its affiliates has obtained at least 125 US dollars through kidnapping for ransom. Uh, and also, uh, as Ayman Zawri like to uh, emphasize in his speeches why it's important to kidnap Western people, because this can use as a bargain uh, for exchange a uh, jailed jihadist in the West or other places. Um, for example, in January 2016, Akim took responsibility for the kidnapping of a Swiss nun in Timbuktu, which is found in Mali. Akim demanded in exchange for a release uh, members, Akim members imprisoned by the Malian government and Ahmad al faki the right one. This one, this one is a member of Ansar Adin. Uh, and Saradin is a Tuareg Salafi organization associated with Akim in Mali. And this guy is, co is uh, currently is in custody uh, of the International Criminal Court for uh, committing uh, crime wars, uh, destroying archaeological and uh, uh, shrines in uh, Mali. This was in 2012 when uh, Ansar Adin and Akim uh, conquered the north of Africa. There was a lot, a big destruction of uh, archaeological sites. Second, uh, the second uh, financial channel is smuggling weapons, drugs, and money from the Atlantic shores to Sinai Peninsula. Uh, the, the use of trade routes in the Sahara for these purposes make it possible for the organization to establish ties and formulate a common economic interest with local smugglers and tribes, such as the Tuareg and Azawadi tribes in Mali. I can add also another uh, uh, ev evolving market, which is the immigration uh, market. Today we see an increasing stream of immigrants from Africa to Europe. Akim is also taking part of that, and other Islamists uh, taking money for that also. But this is for another uh, session. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the lecture, one of Akim's main goal is to overthrow the Algerian, Algerian regime. Since 2007, Akim has conducted more than uh, 650 uh, attacks against Nigerian, uh, against Algerian targets. And luckily, Algerian, Algerian uh, uh, regime has a very successful uh, counter-terrorism uh, campaign. So, um, for example, in May this year, uh, it eliminated Al Rurabah Battalion, which is the oldest branches of Akim in Algeria, and it was was operating in a forested arena in Buhira province in East Algeria. <coughs> Akim realized long time ago that it could not cope efficiently against the pressure of the Algerian military campaign, so it has conducted that regional expansion, regional expansion, that's what we have seen since 2013 also, would provide safe events, manpower resources, funding opportunities, and the ability to, to create new networks and military bases uh, in, region, in regions where there is a security vacuum and remote from the immediate reach of Algeria's military power and political influence. In other words, Akim is interested to maintain its power and to ensure that it won't be defeated by the Algerian uh, army. Akim has identified North Mali or Azawad as an ideal spare to build its strength because of the reason I just mentioned. Drukdel himself, the Emir of Akim, has described in 2013 the importance of keeping Mali under Al Qaeda spares of influence in order to keep it as a refugee and the base for operations. The defeat, oops, the defeat of Hakim its, and the, its affiliates in Mali in 2013 has not changed Hakim's per perception on the importance of Mali. On the contrary, 
Akim has been investing effort to expand its influence all over Mali territory. In uh, 2016, Abu Yahya El Amam revealed that this vision has become actually a reality. So I will quote him. Before the French intervention on uh, the Mujahideen, uh, the Mujahideen were only at the north, but today after the French intervention, the Mujahideen have a foothold in Mali, from the border of Mauritania in the west, to Burkina in the east, to Algeria at the north, and to Bamako at the south. Soldiers from different tribes and races have joined Hakim. So al hamam explained also the rationality of uh, behind this expansion to Central and South Mali and other territories in the Sahel. Bothering to note that Hakim was forced to adopt this strategy, resulting in the defeat in 2013. So we have decided, this is, is in own words, we have decided to expand to more areas in order to force the enemy to scatter and make him weaker. It is impossible for the French troops to control the Sahara territory since because of its huge size, which is bigger than France and Belgium together. Hence, the brothers have decided to expand the, our activity to further territories in Central and Southern uh, of Mali. The goal to is to destroy the power of the enemy, causing him loss in human lives as much as we can and less in our ranks. Mali's topography is different from the Sahara, and central Mali is known for, for its forest and a lot of water and even several mountains area. So in order to deepen Akim's influence in the region, it has begun to cooperate with local actors that don't necessarily share the same ideology uh, by exploiting ethnic disputes and griefness in Mali, but share short-term short, short -term objectives. In 2013, a letter found in Timbuktu from uh, Drukdel he urged his followers to make alliances and concessions to win over the groups in the area. He told his fighters in Mali, this is a very uh, important sentence uh, which, re which uh, reflects the strategy of uh, um, Akim, not Akim, also other affiliates in the region like in Yemen, uh, pretend to be a domestic movement and, to f and fight under the banner of Ansar Adin. Uh, his plan was to cooperate with local uh, jihadist groups uh, to further Al-Qaeda ends and mask, mask that cooperation. So that, as I mentioned, this is true also to other spares like in Libya, Yemen, and also in uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. In this regard, Akim has been cooperating and coordinating in the field of jihad and dawa uh, in Mali with two prominent actors, uh, as, uh, as Abu Yahya al Amam uh, admitted, Ansar Adin. Ansar Adin and the uh, Masina Liberation Front. Thanks to this uh, cooperation, this is, uh, by the way, the map of Mali. What? Uh, in the okay, so uh, thanks to this cooperation with these two Salafi jihadist groups, uh, Akim have widened, widened the pool of recruiters from different ethnicities. Ansar Adin is a Salafi Jihadi Tuareg organization that was established in late 2011 by Yad uh, Agrali and is active mainly in north of Mali. Yeah, you see here, Ansar Adin is active there. The other group which I mentioned, Masina, is active in south of Mali and also in Sichuan. The Tuareg uh, demand an independent state and want to separate from Mali due to historical and political reasons that cannot be discussed here. Uh, many Tuaregs from Libya who served in Gaddafi army joined to Ansar Adin following the collapse of the Libyan regime and are serving as field commanders thanks to their military knowledge. Uh, for a long time, the Tuareg uh, in north of Mali tried to rebel. Four times they tried to rebel against the central regime in Mali. So uh, Akim exploit this uh, dispute between the Tuareg to Mali and to, to recruit people from them. Uh, I should mention Bel Mukhtar, which is the head of the Murabitun uh, uh, group, also part of Akim. He played a prominent role in strengthening the ties with the Tuareg uh, by different means like marriage and uh, economic interest. 
The second uh, group is Masina Liberation Front that was formed in 2015 as an ethnic uh, Fulani Front for Ansar Adin to coordinate actions and operation in Sichuan and Southern Mal Mali. Fulani are Bedouin tribes distri distributed in 15 African towns. Uh, the Fulani are about uh, 12, let's say, 12% uh, of Mali population and is one of the largest ethnic groups in West Africa. Fulani uh, ethnicity have uh, today about 20 million uh, across Africa. Uh, and the concentration, the biggest one is in Mali. Um, so you can see that by exploiting these disputes, uh, El Akim uh, creates opportunities to, to uh, recruit these uh, ethnicities to recruit these people from these ethnicities. Masina is thought to have 14,000 members and uh, its leader, Amadou Kufa, is a loyal ally to Ansar al-Din leader, Iyad al-Rai, Ag Rali. By the way, Iyad al Rali, this guy, he was a, a, a consul of Mali in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia. Here you can see the location of Fulani and Tuari groups. Getting back to Abba Yahya El Amam, uh, Abu Yahya El Amam has boasted that Akim has reached beyond its northern strongholds. Uh, and he also said that there is no need to send today any uh, fighters to southern sexual uh, Mali because they already, Akim is, is managed to uh, establish the cells and uh, supported organization in uh, the south and central, like I mentioned, uh, this uh, Masina uh, group. Now I'm getting, I will, brief, I will refer briefly to Libya. Uh, in, Li in Libya, Akim has uh, close ties with Ansar al Sharia, which is, was formed in 2011. It is believed that it was formed due to Sheikh Ayman al Zawiri instructions, who sent senior. Al Qaeda operative Abu Anas al Libi for this task. Currently, Ansar al Sharia maintains popular uh, support within stronghold in Benghazi, Derna, and possibly also Ajdabiya along the northeastern coastline and continue to work with Libyan Salafi jihadist uh, groups. There are also indications, yes, uh, most recently, that Bel Mukhtar is cooperating with the Council of Ajdabiya Liberation and the Benghazi, Benghazi Defense uh, Battalion. Bel, Bel Mukhtar has established also foothold in uh, southern Libya. The security vacuum in post Gaddafi Libya allowed Akim to have new safe haven, uh, acquire weapon more easily, and recruit, recruit more people. Open training map camps like the one in Ubari, which is uh, found in southwestern uh, Libya, where Ben Mukhtar trained his people to carry out the attack on the Gaza oil in Algeria in 2013. Now, uh, ISIS uh, is also an important actor in the region, and uh, the appearance of ISIS in the region and the growing stream of fighters from North Africa to ISIS gave good reason to Akim to be anxious and worry about it. Moreover, the defections, we saw uh, defections from Akim, these uh, also, uh, Akim uh, saw it as a threat to his existence. I'm going to finish already. Uh, the growing competition between Akim and ISIS seems to be in some way a factor in driving some of Akim leaders to come out from the shadows and give interviews on Akim's growing influence in the region. How bad ISIS in this is in the jihadi coast, claiming that ISIS caliphate was a, a, fal a false one. So what we see in the last year, from the end of 2015, we see an increase of publications of Akim and its affiliates, like Ansar Adin. We can see that uh, many of their publications are being transla translated from Arabic to uh, English and uh, French also. And this is, like, uh, this is part of the competition against ISIS. Also, the quality of uh, this publication, that you, as you can see here, uh, this is a part of this uh, 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 to, delig uh, to delegitimize and to uh, weaken ISIS uh, propaganda. 
So, uh, and also but, uh, recently, because we have witnessed to ISIS uh, defeats in the region, uh, recently Drukdel, the Emir of Akim, went with a special campaign to, to, to return. He called to those who defected, who left uh, Akim and joined ISIS. He said, now you have an opportunity to get back to our ranks. Uh, because see what happens to ISIS. ISIS is not as uh, successful as you thought. So this is time to get back. So till now about 15 uh, members got back. This, this uh, campaign began two weeks ago. And uh, let's see what will happen. Uh, to sum up, uh, we can conclude no doubt that Akim has strengthened its power since its defeat in 2013, expand, expanded to more territories, improved its operati uh, operational capacity in Mali and the wider West African region, and is still expanding. This is thanks to Al-Qaeda general strategy, meaning ex exploiting local ties and connection, connections with local jihadi organization in order to achieve its goals, as well as to appear as a local movemel movement while masking ties to the international organization. In Mali, Akim has been exploiting the Fulani Tuareg uh, com communal tensions and long-standing long, and long standing anger with the central government to recruit young people in central Mali uh, and other regions in the Sahel. Uh, the strengthening of Akim stands out against the backdrop of ISIS weakening power in various fronts due to the latter strategic distress as a result of the strikes by the coalition force in Libya Iraq and Syria. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And now I'm invited uh, then to describe El Shabab and Boko Haram. map uh, for the telepathy. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, actually they, he just created it while after you said that. But the map comes later. So uh, this presentation uh, I think will be useful uh, for three types of people. Um, the first type, which I think there's a lot of people here, are people who study Africa, particularly African militancy, uh, and especially those who study Boko Haram as like a Boko Haramologist, like I am. Although I don't know if there's that many people that focus on Boko Haram that closely. Uh, second is uh, some people study Al-Qaeda ISIS rivalry more generally, uh, but not necessarily in the West African context or the uh, East African context like Al-Shabaab. For those people, um, the Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab cases make good case studies for their overall studies of how the AQIS jihadist interplay is working. And third, uh, there's actually been quite significant, particularly on the Boko Haram side, uh, jihadist ideological debates about what various terms mean, who's a Muslim, who's not a Muslim, who can you kill for being an infidel, who can you kill, and that stuff. This is actually what jihadist debates <laughs> are about, and uh, you can say that they get into different levels of analysis, and in the Boko Haram case, they've uh, sort of contributed to this overall body of work on jihadist ideology. So that's what this uh, will be about. Now, um, the only background I really want to provide uh, as we start in West Africa before shifting a little bit to East Africa is uh, to say that uh, in my very strong view, the driver of the Boko Haram insurgency in terms of the violence uh, since the beginning has really been Al-Qaeda. And this is actually the minority view amongst, say, academics or analysts because like some of the other speakers have said, Al-Qaeda doesn't always want to be very evident about what it does. And in fact, it would in recent years prefer to be very quiet about what it does so that international counterinsurgent forces don't go attack Al-Qaeda everywhere. And in particular, ISIS has been a blessing for Al-Qaeda because everyone just talks about ISIS all the time uh, and doesn't really talk about Al-Qaeda. So the whole idea of disguising your hand is, is not really new to Al-Qaeda, but it's actually working very well. Uh, so here's the way that I think Al-Qaeda has driven the Boko Haram insurgency. Boko Haram was always a very Salafi jihadi preaching group. Uh, it's, if you look at its discourses before the jihad was announced in 2009 or 2010, 
the the imams of Boko Haram were speaking according to all of the main principles of Salafi jihadi ideology in a very perfect way. A lot of times people write them off as crazy. It's not true, unless you consider all Salafi jihadis crazy. Boko Haram was uh, very steeped in the ideology, uh, in the reference points and everything. There was nothing uh, wacko about it. It was, uh, you know, very uh, standard, I can say. Now, after they declared the jihad in 2009, 2010, when the government cracked down and basically tried to kill them all, uh, maybe killed 800 to 1,000 of them, and Boko Haram killed some of the government too, um, Boko Haram shifted from a preaching to jihad. And that's why the group's original name was the Sunni Muslim group for preaching a jihad. Um, now, they had made some relationships with Al-Qaeda in the mid-2000s, and these you know, blossomed very quickly between 2009 and 2010, and that's why actually um, the, when Boko Haram first got on the international scene, it was because of what it did in the northwest of Nigeria, actually. Places like the capital Abuja, where it attacked the UN in 2011, and churches uh, in the Middle Belt region in the center of the country. These were big suicide bombings, simultaneous ones, the types where you uh, do a bombing and then you leave another bomb when the rescuers come and then you blow that, you know, blow them up too. This is very Al-Qaeda-ish. But these attacks in the northwest of the country uh, in around 2011 to 2013 uh, were sporadic, you know, once every two months, three months, stuff like that. So it was very terrorism oriented. That's what got the international media and what made Boko Haram big initially. The northeast is sort of the root of where the organization was formed and that was sort of the base of the movement and the attacks there after 2009 were like every day but they were just shootings burning down churches attacking imams that they didn't like and stuff like that so you had actually a terrorism if we can use that definition in the northwest and more insurgency in the northeast if we can accept at least we can the, the terms are not clear because people don't agree on what terrorism and insurgency are but the northwest had a different type of violence than the northeast okay the, north, the Northeast being in pink. Um, later in the Northwest, you had a group called Ansaru emerge, Ansar al-Muslim Ifibillah de Sudan, the Su uh, which is the Muslim protectors in black Africa. This was an Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb project or front group or faction in Northwestern Nigeria. They became open in 2012 in response to Boko Haram killing innocent civilians in the Northeast and Boko Haram killed innocent civilians in the Northeast because they basically believed every Muslim who didn't join their jihad was therefore an apostate, so it didn't matter who gets killed. And if you collaborated with the government, you had a passport, you deserved to be killed. So the guys in the Northwest disagreed with that. Um, but they, ended up, they carried out their attacks on churches and uh, the government and so forth in the Northwest, again, sporadically. The big change was when the Mali intervention happened in February 2013. The French led the intervention. AQIM dispersed, connections to Nigeria got um, stifled, and that's when you actually had somewhat of a reintegration of this Northwestern network into the Northeast. In addition, Nigeria did good uh, counterterrorism, not necessarily counterinsurgency, in the Northwest, where working with international partners, they listened in on phone calls and all that, and they broke up the cells in the Northwest, because it's not really an insurgency in the Northwest, it was cells. Northeast is more grassroots based. They broke up the cells in the Northwest. Mali intervention happened, so these Al-Qaeda type guys in the Northwest moved to the Northeast. They came to a reconciliation with the Boko Haram in the Northeast. And then you had these very good, say, terrorists on top of this insurgency. And they took skills that some of them had learned in Mali and so forth, and they began running down military barracks in Nigeria's Northeast. And by running down military barracks in a very good tactical way in the Northeast, the Nigerian military basically fell apart. In, in the Northeast, particularly Borno State, and that's when BH began holding territory in the Northeast and began setting up their caliphate, which was always their goal. By the time that the barracks started falling in the Northeast and there was basically no military presence, ISIS was now emerging on the scene. And um, in the Northwest African context, a lot of the militants who became ISIS were former Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb members, are part of that AQIM network, and they had shifted their loyalty from Al-Qaeda to ISIS because they were really attracted to the idea of the caliphate. So what actually happened was the former Al-Qaeda guys from the Northwest who reintegrated with the guys in the Northeast 
were able to leverage their connections to other AQIM guys in northern Africa, like Libya, to connect with ISIS in Syria and basically extend a link to Syria to Nigeria via these Libya Tunisia guys who all used to be part of AQIM. And that's why the former Al Qaeda guys sort of drove the relationship to ISIS. And once BH began to have territory in the northeast of the country, that became very attractive uh, for ISIS because they're creating a caliphate. Now Boko Haram's got the territory. And um, that being said, the relationship wasn't that smooth the whole time. Because as I mentioned, these guys in Al Qaeda in the northwest were never that fond of the guys in the northeast because of ideological differences about basically which Muslims it's okay to kill. Okay? That's, that's basically the main argument. So uh, what you have most recently happening, which is the big Boko Haram news of the last year, is that in August 2016, which is last month, the ISIS West Africa province has come to like a civil war. Now, what is happening in the civil war between the ISIS West Africa province? What's happening is the guys who used to be in Al-Qaeda joined with the northeastern guys, the terrorists with the insurgents, if you can say, and they together pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda, I mean to ISIS, yeah. And um, <coughs> what's happening now, however, is um, the Al-Qaeda guys have basically kicked out, the northwestern guys have basically kicked out the northeastern guys from the Islamic State West Africa province. This is a little surprising because if you, the North guys who are based in the Northeast have an ideology much closer to ISIS than did the guys in the Northwest. Because ISIS is okay with killing a lot of people and brutality, so are the guys in the Northeast. So you have these former Al-Qaeda guys joining with the guys in the Northeast who are similar to ISIS, but then they've actually kicked out the Northeasterners from the leadership, and now they actually control ISIS West Africa province. And the insurgents who used to be based in the Northeast have reverted to their original pre-ISIS selves. I don't know if that was clear, but that's what's happened. But it's, it's, a, it's a contradiction. It's clear to Boko Haram. It's, it's clear to me. <laughs> it's clear to Boko Haram. I'm trying to make it clear to you. Okay, and, but, but so, so what we can say is we have a contradiction at hand, and the contradiction is that you have former Al-Qaeda guys who are maintaining their Al-Qaeda-like ideology, which is different than ISIS, now leading the ISIS West Africa province, while the members of Boko Haram that actually have an ideology like ISIS have been kicked out. So what explains this? Uh, one thing that could explain this contradiction is that the, um, the, Al the former Al-Qaeda guys prioritize the vision of a caliphate that they can have today over their ideological differences with ISIS. And they recognize that Al-Qaeda has a very long-term strategy for creating the caliphate and these guys are young and they want the caliphate today. So they're prioritizing the caliphacy of having the Islamic State in West Africa, at least in, in theory, uh, over their ideological differences. That's one possibility. And, th and that's not inconsistent with what some other former Al-Qaeda groups have done around the world. A second theory is that the two leaders of this IS West Africa province, um, who are both former Al-Qaeda guys, Abu Musa al-Barnawi, the son of the founder, and Mama Noor, who's wanted by FBI, Interpol, he did the UN headquarters attack, that they're actually Al-Qaeda agents, and that they are infiltrating ISIS in order to destroy the ISIS West Africa province, which they're basically in the process of doing, and later they'll rejoin Al-Qaeda. And this is also consistent with what Al-Qaeda is doing in Yemen, Afghanistan, and trying to do elsewhere. In other words, recognizing that ISIS is now crumbling in a lot of places and recognizing that a lot of Al-Qaeda people defected to ISIS, Al-Qaeda is now reaching out to them or even actively encouraging them to join ISIS and saying, now that you're in ISIS and ISIS is failing, go destroy ISIS and then bring everyone back to Al-Qaeda. In other words, Al-Qaeda is trying to benefit from the growth of the jihadist marketplace that ISIS created and then just make everyone sort of recant their joining ISIS and come back to Al-Qaeda. And it's very possible that these guys are Al-Qaeda agents. Keep in mind, uh, emotionally, if you listen to what they say, they, 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 without saying Al-Qaeda, they still thank you know, the militants in the greater Sahara, basically meaning AQIM, for having helped them after the government cracked down in 2009. Um, AQIM said a lot of praise for the founder of Boko Haram, whose son is now the leader of West Africa province. Historically, they spent time with AQIM in, in Mali and these places. And operationally, they carried out attacks with AQIM. So, I mean, they're deeply embedded in AQ, so I wouldn't be surprised if they are 
uh, ploying to just destroy the ISIS West Africa province and destroy the ISIS Africa project. Um, and, and another possibility is, as I said, they've always not liked the leader of the Northeast, basically, Shikau. He's very famous for killing a lot of people. So basically, by joining with Shikau to create this ISIS West Africa province, and by controlling the lines of communication to ISIS, and then cutting off Shikau talking to ISIS, they were able to tell ISIS bad things about Shikau, and then make ISIS formally drop Shikau, and then elevate themselves. So if they really do like ISIS, maybe they just wanted to kick out Shikau. So now Shikau is running his own operation independently again. So that's um, sort of that story. Now this um, is somewhat of a different counterexample to what we see from al-Shabaab in Somalia because uh, ISIS was not able to overcome uh, al-Shabaab like it wanted to and basically make them all defect and become a Somali province of uh, ISIS. Uh, in the case of Nigeria, Although Boko Haram had collaborated with Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, it was never really a formal affiliate of Al-Qaeda. It was more like a partner, and the relationship was not that strong. Now, ISIS succeeded in um, forcing the defection of zero true Al-Qaeda affiliates. AQIM didn't defect, the Taliban didn't defect, just small factions. And Al-Shabaab stayed true to Al-Qaeda which shows that despite whatever pressure ISIS put through its videos and the caliphate declaration, the al-Qaeda movement was uh, stronger than people anticipated in 2014 because the core of the movement you know, held. It was only some side factions uh, that pushed away and Boko Haram was perhaps the most prominent example of a friend that left al-Qaeda but might be coming back. Um, so what ISIS has been able to do, however, is pull you know, a few Mm, parts of the broader Al-Shabaab network to it. And although it hasn't gotten the core of Al-Shabaab, it's gotten some foreign fighters um, from Al-Shabaab, as well as Somalis who live abroad, including in Europe, who have been part of Al-Shabaab. Uh, maybe more of these global cultural types have been interested in the global caliphate, and they've joined uh, ISIS. So that's one type of Al-Shabaab follower that ISIS has pulled. Um, they've also pulled, tended to pull decently on like the Swahili coast below Somalia, but in like the Kenya, Tanzania coast where people speak Swahili, not Somali, um, because these people are further removed from the core of Al-Shabaab. They're not living in Al-Shabaab territories in Somalia. And, um, and as they're sort of more independent from the core of Al-Shabaab, they've been able to join, uh, you know, they've had more freedom to say join ISIS without having to worry about Al-Shabaab crackdowns. Um, and, and I think youths in general, the, the next generation of jihadists in Somalia or Kenya, Tanzania, have also tended to be interested to ISIS because ISIS has sort of an appeal to the youth. You have a caliphate today, you're strong, they have the videos. While um, you know, Al-Shabaab is an affiliate of Al-Qaeda and it has sort of a more controlled doctrine and it just might not be as exciting for what ISIS can promise you uh, today there's a little more discipline in the ranks, and youth sometimes don't like the discipline, and I would say ISIS has sort of more uh, dream possibilities for a youth than al-Shabaab with its uh, rigidness. Um, and, uh, but in, in general, in Somalia, the insurgency grinds on. There's obviously the, the various UN East African forces, Somali government fighting al-Shabaab. Um, progress has been made in the past years, but um, al-Shabaab is pretty stable in the countryside, at least for the short term. Uh, they obviously have, you know, grassroots networks, and uh, we can say that the insurgency with al-Shabaab uh, in Somalia is not ending soon, um, but perhaps uh, the pressure on al-Shabaab in Somalia will make it difficult for it to attack Kenya, Uganda, and other countries if it needs to force at the home front. So even if they can't defeat al-Shabaab in Somalia, at least the pressure on al-Shabaab in Somalia keeps it from lashing out more sub-regionally. And... Um, this is just an image of one of the leaders of ISIS Somalia, even though they don't have a province, who left Shabab. He's lived in the UK for a long time, and uh, he helped uh, segue the ISIS relationship. And ISIS actually tried to set up a whole Twitter social media thing, like they did with Boko Haram at one point, with, with al-Shabaab, but uh, it, it sort of died out. Maybe the person running it got killed, I don't know. But that's just sort of an example of how ISIS did not succeed in making the whole Somalia venture what it had anticipated. And now that ISIS is generally on the ropes throughout Libya, Syria, wherever, it seems unlikely that they'll s all of a sudden be able to um, elevate uh, Somalia. 
Um, but uh, but you should also uh, pay attention to just the Swahili coast um, and not even Al-Qaeda or ISIS, but just the um, sort of the Muslim Brotherhood type groups who uh, are pushing the narrative that, you know, Swahili coast used to be Islamic Emirates, things used to be great then, Sharia law. And by creating this narrative about things that used to be so great when Islam was prevailing before Kenya and Tanzania became countries can help a narrative that feeds into what uh, Al-Shabaab and ISIS recruit on. So I think that's, uh, that's a, uh, an issue too. Um, so some long-term thoughts. Um, so, you know, as we've said, ISIS came on strong but quick. AQ uh, managed to uh, shield itself from the ISIS challenge and AQ is playing a long game. And it's trying to benefit from the fact that the rise of ISIS created more jihadists around the world. And it's trying to use that extra market share to bring it back into the Al-Qaeda market over time. And Al-Qaeda is working very hard on that in the ideological as well as a operational as well as the covert end as we saw with Boko Haram. Um, in Northwest Africa in particular, we've seen AQIM actually be a little bit different than other Al-Qaeda affiliates by being somewhat accommodating of the IS interest among youths, young jihadists in Northwest Africa. Uh, just as one example of that is they made some videos that sort of copied the IS style and talked about, you know, the, you know, the territories of the Caliphate and the Mujahideen. So they've, you know, they've been flexible understanding that a lot of youths in Northwest Africa want ISIS, but they, s they just want to keep them in the AQIM uh, umbrella still. And I think part of that has to do with the organizational psychology of AQIM because they had fought with, you know, ultra tech theories in the civil war in Algeria back in the 90s. So they sort of know how to deal with uh, ISIS type mentality. And I think that's why they're, they're managing this in a very diplomatic way and ultimately trying to bring in all these young people who like some things about ISIS back to AQIM. Um, and then the Mali situation is quite important. Uh, as the speaker has just said, there's something like 600 attacks in the country in what, la last year or two. There's a lot of AQ activity in Mali, despite some ISIS effort to plant some cells there. And AQ has front groups there. It has uh, all different types of uh, networks in Mali. And from Mali, it can easily connect to Nigeria, offer support, logistics, um, money. Uh, so, and you know, Mali is located near to Senegal. Uh, Aaron Zellin just spoke about Senegal. Basically, having such a network in Mali allows AQ to do a lot, at least in the West African uh, context, because Mali is central in that region. Um, and in terms of jihadist factional feuds, um, I think it's very important to look at what AQ has to offer in terms of its typologies and its emirate system. ISIS is just ISIS. It doesn't have that many friends. You basically need to become ISIS. You can't really keep your own identity and just become an ally. You need to be sub, um, subsumed. Whereas AQ has all these typologies like uh, front groups, allies, affiliates, non-affiliate affiliates, um, you have, uh, you know, like that's a, in Syria, they have groups that are actually affiliates, but they're not affiliates. They say they're not affiliates. Um, all these different, you know, they have projects, cells. So AQ is quite flexible. And, and I think you're going to see more of that in Africa. And in particular, they won't call themselves Al-Qaeda because, again, they don't want people to be watching them too much. And their emirate system is the idea that they can create little territories around the world over the course of, say, the next 50 years. It's not important to them time. And then eventually they can connect them. So they can have a little Mali one, a Northeast Nigeria one, a Somali one, a Libya one. And if you get enough of them, like 50 of them over time, by the year 2080, maybe they can all join uh, in some way. Um, you know, ISIS is somewhat turning into a virtual caliphate, at least in the Africa context, if not the rest of the world. Uh, they still have very strong networks amongst people, especially on social media. And even though they're losing their territories in Africa, um, they still have a lot of African foreign fighters who are with them, Senegalese, Ghanaians, uh, we've seen Nigerians, Malians. And uh, I think the biggest risk in that, if I could point out one, is that um, what Syria was to these European attacks is what Libya could be to West African attacks. West Africa has not really seen um, although AQIM has done some recent attacks, you haven't seen, say, like lone wolf operations uh, in West Africa so much that get advertised on the media, uh, or East Africa. Um, and 
we just might see the former Libya network become something like um, a foreign fighter network in West Africa, like we saw in Europe, okay? With L Libya being the equivalent to Syria, and maybe countries like Senegal or uh, Ghana uh, or Kenya being attacked like Paris, maybe not as big, from headquarters of Libya ISIS members using the foreign fighter networks. Um, and then I think on the broader scale, we can also look in particular at, say, Al-Qaeda's efforts in Syria and Afghanistan with the Taliban, basically. And I think that has some significance uh, for Africa because if uh, Al-Qaeda succeeds in its emirate system, which ISIS said was the wrong system, and, and Al-Qaeda basically gets a hold of part of Syria for the long term, and the Taliban starts doing really well in Afghanistan, and they set up their Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan again. It'll add legitimacy to the Al-Qaeda methodology, which ISIS had been uh, attacking so much in, in their uh, speeches. And Al-Qaeda can basically say, look, ISIS's way doesn't work. Our way is actually working, although it takes more time. And if that's the case, it will make some of these young African jihadists see that, they, that the patience of Al-Qaeda is actually preferable to the you know, immediate caliphate today of ISIS, and it'll prove that the AQ model is a little bit better and will help Al-Qaeda win back the jihadist market share that ISIS took over the past few years. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob. And now we have the, our last presentation, Jonathan Perez. It will look uh, on the phenomenon on Africa from different view. And I hope that it's close the uh, uh, topics that we are talking about. fix this is up. Um, I'm going to just get started with the preliminaries. Uh, this has been a long morning, so I, I offer a time to shorten mine by, by five or ten minutes or so, so we can have a little more uh, uh, questions and answers. Um, that's why I like to go last. I think there is an inverse relationship. I think people remember more the shorter the speech. So um, I'm going to do a relatively short speech. Uh, Steve, this is the map you uh, requested. Why is it kind of off left there? Is it all right? Well, anyway, uh, it's the it's on the right. Um, so that gives you at least a picture of the 54 countries that make up Africa. The subject of my talk is a little bit different. Um, it's it's on China's future counterterrorism footprint in East Africa. But first, let me just complete the uh, the thoughts that uh, Jacob so well articulated, and that is on the terror threat in East Africa. I would say that the United States is the most deeply involved of the outside powers with both Kenya and Ethiopia on counterterrorism, mainly because of the al-Shabaab's threat. While there have, have been successes in eliminating al-Shabaab leadership and limiting its area of control, al-Shabaab continues to pose a serious threat. They just keep replacing its deposed leaders with somebody new. It does not seem to have much trouble attracting young recruits. Ethiopian and Kenyan counterterrorism objectives are not uh, always in harmony with each other or with the objectives of the Somali government, although the coordination, as Ambassador Kamani is working so hard to do, is improving all the time, especially with the IGAD. There does not seem um, to be a light at the end of the tunnel yet. The situation is complicated, and uh, by the, um, in the recent months, the growing ethnic problems in Ethiopia. The United States, and to some extent the EU, is caught in the middle. Now, China has been generally supportive of Western policy in Somalia, but it doesn't want to get too close to the United States' counterterrorism policy in the region, which it has concerns about. It works more closely with the African Union and individual African countries on counterterrorism. It focuses on economic development as the long-term cure to extremism. While there is value in this, there is also a short-term security threat that must be neutralized. China would rather not get in the middle of that problem, leave it to the Americans, especially in places like Ethiopia and Kenya, where it has its own important economic interest. And the U.S. 
as I said earlier, is in the lead. On the other hand, it appears that China is doing more and more intel sharing and selling more and more CT equipment, um, perhaps more than we're aware of. So that's the background of, of the al-Shabaab and, and the, the, the specific issue uh, affecting Kenya and Ethiopia. Now I want to broaden the subject to China's future counterterrorism strategy and footprint in, in the region. What, is this a backseat driver? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maze. Maze. Um, no, it was, I think it was a nice flow. But anyway, uh, no, that counts. It counts. Yeah, yeah. You, you tell me when you want me to quit. I, I can think. Um, but no, uh, Etan is right. I want to I get right to the questions. Here are, here are the questions that I want you to think about because we really don't have time to give you the answers. How is China going to respond in the longer term? to incidents not only in Africa, but incidents like in, in this Chinese embassy in Kyrgyzstan had a suicide bombing. What exactly does the new counterterrorism law that they just created uh, a year ago <coughs> permit China's military and police force to do abroad? If they undertake an operation abroad and innocent locals get killed, what does that do to China's position in that country? Three, with the, the rise of social media inside China, and public opinion, will the Chinese government be pushed into more forceful responses to future kidnappings and worse, uh, especially involving their diplomats in Africa? And four, what is it that China must change in the way it does uh, its overseas economic work? What, right now, they tend to live in isolated camps. And the problem is, as all of you know in the counterterrorism business, you have to have local knowledge, okay? You have to know your locality, and the Chinese are just blind. So I think what their, their new counterterrorism strategy will require much better local knowledge and integration of the overseas Chinese into the communities that they live in. There's, there's going to be no more of this isolation, and I, I also think there may even be uh, a development of intel-based preemption. Um, any, and, and perhaps here uh, there may be a potential for Chinese counterterrorism successes. And I just say as a footnote to the few Israelis in the room, there may be some lessons that they can learn uh, from Israel, especially as Israel increases its involvement in East Africa. So that's in a nutshell what I wanted to say. Let me just throw out a few, a few more thoughts and then we'll, we'll get into the questions and answers. Um, the, the long-term uh, growth area, I believe, for China in Africa is not economic, it's not political, it's private security companies. They uh, have had been really hit hard by a, a bunch of events, and uh, they're, they're really catching up, they're trying to catch up. But let me just say that the idea of the, the private security companies should provide services for their Chinese clients is clients that also foster the development of African structures without superseding the state institutions in the monopoly of violence. In other words, they have to be very sensitive to their host countries. They can't walk around like Blackwater guys uh, with guns and, and, and get into shootouts uh, on territory uh, that is not there. So that is a, that's, that's sort of a problem, but they have to adapt to the rules of the game. Now, given the trends in terrorism in the last 18 months in Europe, I believe that it's only a matter of time be before Chinese are targeted, not just for criminal activity, you know, they do carry a, lots of cash, uh, they're perceived as rich, but that's, that's just criminal. Um, and not just because, as one of the earlier speakers pointed out, they, they are foreigners living and working with other foreigners in places like Bamako and, and Ouagadougou. Um, did I pronounce that right, Jacob? Okay, thank you. Um, but actually, they're going to start being targeted for reasons of their uh, oppression of the Uyghur minority. And the Uyghur minority, as most of you know, are the eight million uh, Turkic Chinese in the western province of Xinjiang, uh, with strong relations with the Turks, uh, Turkic countries in Central Asia. Um, and so, because the, the Uyghurs are Sunni, there is a, a link ideologically to the ISIS uh, and to, to the other Sunni uh, terrorists. And we have had some reports, nothing conclusive, 
but some reports that some Uyghurs are training in ISIS bases in Syria. So what does this mean? It means that the Uyghur, the Uyghur militants with, uh, it's called the Turkestan Islamic Movement, or TIM, T-I-M, from Xinjiang in Western Af uh, China, have been training in places all over, uh, all over the world, but especially in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and now the Middle East. Finally, we have this, uh, this Uyghur suicide bomber at the Chinese embassy in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so I believe it's only a matter of time before the million, about a million two hundred thousand Chinese living and working in, in Africa become targets. How will the Chinese handle a high visibility kidnapping or targeting uh, of, of Chinese diplomats? Well, as I said, the social media will be very hawkish, but the Chinese modus operandi will probably be to do it quietly, work with the host government, go to the United Nations, and as a last resort only rely on Chinese soldiers based in one of their new overseas bases, and more on that in a second. China's main security objective is to protect its economic interests, assets, and personnel in Africa and off African shores. As Chinese living abroad grow more numerous and prosperous, they become targets. China's security interests abroad will naturally expand. China's security objective has evolved now into a military base in Djibouti, which you can't really see there, but it's just uh, to the right of, of Ethiopia. An extremely important strategic place, not only to East Africa, but to the Middle East and to Israel in particular. It's the gateway to the Red Sea. Um, <coughs> So, Steve, pay attention to Djibouti. Um, if, and, and I think that you can see the evolution of this base. It began when China started participating uh, in the anti-piracy um, um, initiatives back in 2008. So it's been an incremental uh, process. The real uh, wake-up call for China has been not in Kenya and Ethiopia. It's been in Libya. I mean, they, they were caught. Uh, when Gaddafi was overthrown with 36,000 workers, 36,000 Chinese workers in Libya. I mean, how many, how big is Libya? I don't think they have more than four or five million people. And these Chinese people were stranded in the middle of a civil war and they had to be evacuated. And this is when China developed uh, in a very short time an expertise in mass evacuation using their P PLA, that means a uh, People's Liberation Army Navy, so it's called PLAN, the plan, uh, and they're, they're getting rather good at it. They've just evacuated some people from Yemen uh, a year and a half ago. So that's the first phase. The first phase now is that anybody working for a Chinese company abroad has to be protected. Uh, they're not going to be caught again not knowing how many people they have working in a specific country, particularly people working for Chinese state-owned companies, and in some cases, large private companies. The second phase is that China uh, is starting to get very active within the United Nations in peacekeeping operations where there are Chinese workers. Uh, let's begin with Mali. They started with Mali. They sent 800 uh, uh, people over there, mainly non-combat troops, but a few combat troops uh, in Mali. But where they're really active is in South Sudan. What happened you know, with China and Sudan is they had a huge oil uh, infrastructure and pipeline that happened to be on both sides of the border when the, the new country of South Sudan was uh, created. Then they, 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 they found themselves in the middle of a civil war in South Sudan. So they have, uh, and, but their workers have to stay there to keep the oil pipeline going. So they have, through, the, through their growing power within the United Nations bureaucracy, persuaded the UN to have up to 3,000 combat trained uh, troops working in Juba uh, as in the peacekeeping operation. This is a very interesting uh, incremental, I call it the second phase. Now what's going to be the third phase? Well, I think the goal of China is, in, its, is in its expanding presence uh, in Africa 
is part of their new security presence overall. It's a direct result of China's increasing global stance, both in economics and security. It aims to establish itself as a great power that contributes to global security and to protect its interests abroad. Well, with those lofty words, let's try to figure out what that, that means uh, uh, in, in, in actuality. Um, I believe that this third phase, this jump from peacekeeping operations, uh, will be uh, something a little bit more military, a little bit more unilateral. Um, China's uh, People's Liberation Army announced uh, a new counterterrorism law just a year ago that allows the PLA, their army, to send special forces overseas anywhere to protect and evacuate Chinese personnel or assets. And finally, you have uh, this, this Djibouti base, okay? Now, it's, they're not the only ones who have a military base in this tiny place called Djibouti, but uh, they're not only building a base there, but they're also building a port there. And 70% of the products uh, from Ethiopia come out through Djibouti. And they also happen to be building the roads and the trains from Addis Ababa to Djibouti. So they, they have a kind of a strategic plan with, with uh, Djibouti and, and, and Ethiopia. I, I call Djibouti uh, Ethiopia's Hong Kong, but it, because of Eritrea being uh, uh, an enemy of Ethiopia and because of Somalia being still a rather ins unstable place, the only uh, place out to water for Ethiopia is Djibouti. Otherwise, they're landlocked. So, to summarize, Eitan, I'm very happy. to summarize, yes. Um, that's it. <laughs> no, it's not a summary. It's you want summary. me to give a summary? No, summary, sure. Right, you want me to put the, put the paper down and give you a summary? Okay. okay. Um, look, the fact of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, is that China is, is, is everywhere now, so you can't have a discussion on anything without having the China factor. Uh, but in particular, um, Africa has become a, a kind of a uh, uh, it's not so strategic in the, in the contest with the United States, what goes on in Africa. China can experiment in Africa. They can experiment in the way they do business. They can experiment politically. They can experiment in security and particularly in counterterrorism. They're learning. They're practicing. <coughs> and Djibouti is an excellent example of that. Uh, you know, they have this non-interference principle since the beginning of Mao that you don't interfere abroad, you don't have military bases abroad. But they are pushing the envelope, and I believe that, that, um, that um, it's going to be very interesting for them when they really run into some serious Entebbe-like situations. Would they do an Entebbe? I don't think so. But it's going to be very interesting to watch because there's no doubt about it, but terrorism against Chinese individuals is going to be uh, uh, one of the fastest growing industries in the next 20 years. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you very much. Can we have a summary of a summary? <laughs> okay, I want to be balanced, so I, I ask my, uh, one of my MA students that is a UN analyst to give us a description who are the forces that are operating on Africa soil, not only from the China uh, point of view. So please come to the topic step. He had two minutes. <laughs> you can help me. Yeah, just on the one slide. Yeah. So um, now it's good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yes, I'm here as a student of Dr. Azani. That's the best introduction. Uh, I'd like to talk about international support for counterterrorism in Africa. Um, as the time is limited, I wish to highlight two key characteristics of the terrorist groups in Africa. Um, one is transborder presence, operation with the insurgency capability, uh, and also cooperation among the groups. Uh, and also uh, uh, localized groups. Some groups might have been uh, pretending as localized group, as already discussed, inc prominently including Marabitoon, for example. Um, uh, such tendencies became more prominent 
after so-called Arab Spring. It could be Arab Winter, but it's Africa, so it could be summer. Uh, historically, there have been counterterrorism efforts by responsible governments even before 9-11, uh, which continue until today. Um, however, compared to the extensive trans-border capability of these terrorist groups, individual government capabilities have been limited. Uh, when I was in Western Sahara, for example, uh, in a, especially in the polisario controlled area, there's no country and government wide the Murabitun related people are uh, driving around with uh, enhanced fuel tank pickup and uh, no one can catch them. So that's the situation. Uh, so international community and regional organizations have gradually uh, formed and increased the support for the respective government in combating these terrorist groups. Some of them are led by major international players, allied by neighboring countries such as US-led OEFs in Horn of Africa and uh, Trans-Sahara. Um, the African Union uh, is leading efforts to uh, support Somali government fighting against Shabab. Um, AU mission in Somalia is also logistically supported by the UN. Kenya and Uganda are leading um, countries to support counterterrorism operations. Um, economic community of Western African states, ECOWAS, including Ghana and Nigeria, we have colleagues here, um, have been playing an important role in countering uh, AQIM, uh, deploying African-led international support mission to Mali, AFISMA. Uh, its function has been uh, succeeded by the uh, UN multidimensional integrated stabilization mission in Mali, MINUSMA, uh, which was mandated to support modern authorities in stabilization in northern Mali and to take active steps uh, to prevent the return of armed elements while the military operation capability was, in fact, so there we have been conducting a patrol in the northern Mali. So when we encounter the forces, yes, we fight back, but they're not chasing around uh, the terrorist groups. Chasing around terrorist group is uh, done by another multinational uh, framework led by France. Uh, ECOWAS and its member states, and in addition to Cameroon, we have also a colleague from Cameroon here, uh, are also consolidating efforts in countering Boko Haram, uh, or ISS in the Western uh, Africa. The US, France, and other countries are supporting such efforts. Uh, briefly, lastly, uh, I'd like to mention UN efforts in this end. Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force uh, leads international community support in the capacity building of a uh, uh, state, as the, uh, uh, we have seen the keynote speech in the first day by its director. Uh, as we discussed, MINUSMA is mandated to use force to support the stability and the protection of the civilians, so that's quite unique. Uh, and the overall, uh, while facing a threat of major threat, uh, major uh, threats of terrorist attack as a soft target, uh, as witnessed in major fatal attacks in our jails, Abuja, Somalia, and Mali repeatedly, in fact, uh, UN continues to stay and deliver um, uh, political peacekeeping, humanitarian development supports in these areas. Uh, in this end, it is core mission of my office, actually I belong to the UN Department of Safety and Security as an information analyst, uh, to enable uh, safest and the most efficient conduct of the programs and activities of the UN in such high-risk environments. So this concludes a quick overview of the international support for counterterrorism in actions in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, if you survive our presentation, you can survive even attack of Al-Qaeda or ISIS. <laughs> so I, uh, we have uh, a 20 minutes, so I open the stage for questions. To the panelists, you can ask whatever question you ask. We have here panelists from all over the world, and I hope that will be a nice uh, discussion. Yes, please. these groups in their ideology. Uh, 
So the rhetorics of slavery, whether today or in the past, and how those play out in, in the way these groups align themselves. Uh, then the impact of Ahmed Fadi's prosecution at the ICC, what do you think it is? Uh, and finally, Professor, in terms of the thrust of the presentation <laughs> was very much to look at Africa from the outside. And it, I found it extremely valuable, and the level of expertise was so clear and compelling. Next year, we want to look at Africa from, from the inside. inside. I got you. I got you. So I suggest something. Next year, it will be your responsibility <laughs> to run this panel. You bring the expert, and we will sit near you and sit in this place and listen to you. Okay? Excellent. Okay. Who? Well, I'll, I'll make a, one yeah. comment. Uh, I think it's very interesting, the uh, sort of racial uh, narrative debate that you're talking about. Uh, and then we can get into the, the Mali question. Because um, if you look at objectives towards the U.S., um, I think both Al-Qaeda and uh, Muslim Brotherhood type groups uh, want over the long term to convert American black people to become Muslims. Uh, and they're doing this one, um, some of the Amer black people who came to the US as slaves like 300, 400 years ago were nominally Muslim or from Muslim background. Um, so they're trying to make a narrative that American black people are, uh, their grandparents were Muslims so they need to revert to Islam. Um, then um, they use oppression language with anybody. Even if they're oppressing, they'll say we're actually being oppressed. So they use that anywhere. Now, with the current uh, racial issues in the United States, I think it's, you, you can have a discussion about whether there's oppression or not uh, of American black people today. Even if all the laws statutorily are uh, equality, you can say there's racial injustices. Sort of. So um, the idea of injustice or oppression fits uh, perfectly into the narrative of Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood to um, tell American black people and reach out to them that you're being oppressed and Islam is the solution. It's the exact same type of argument that they say to people on the Swahili coast in Kenya, saying, oh, you used to have a great Islamic emirate, things used to be perfect, now you have a new state, things aren't perfect, if you just you know, come to Al-Qaeda, then things will be perfect again. And the Bantu, the Bantu. Yeah, so th these types of narratives. And, and so it's not surprising to me that just Al-Qaeda this week, Ayman al-Zawahiri Ayman al uh, did a speech in which he invited American black people to basically yes. become Muslims. Yes. The last uh, one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was just a few days ago. Yeah. So, so, so this is it, and, and, you, and then there's um, different uh, ways um, Al-Qaeda tries to play on race and ethnicity within that um, just African alone context, which is perhaps a different discussion. Uh, I, I haven't really followed the case of the ICC with the Timbuktu historical monuments, um, except that uh, th there is some uh, legitimacy to the criticism that this guy's on trial for uh, knocking down the shrines, which is actually a very important cultural legacy, but yet you know, other Mujao people were cutting off hands, doing all different types of people, Mujao being the Al-Qaeda uh, front group, sort of, in Mali at that time, and uh, no one's really being prosecuted for like, having killed a lot of people at the ICC. It's just you know, for knocking down the shrines. Um, and then my final comment on the shrines, though, is that uh, there is an attempt to sort of destroy Sufism in West Africa. Uh, I was just in Senegal before I flew here just recently. And um, that whole idea to destroy Sufism, which is why the guy is on trial at the ICC, is because they want to replace Sufism with Salafism. And uh, Salafism has had a tendency in Africa, especially Nigeria, to have certain sects break away from the mainstream and then become the Salafi jihadists. So that's... Uh, a trend to watch for if you're studying jihadism. Somebody else want to comment? Michael? Okay, another question? Yes, please. Raise your voice.
Yeah, that's the... Um, it, it basically, to speak louder, because I have the microphone, um, as there was not an internal African on this panel, there's also a sort of recommendation that next year we do a panel focusing on China, because although Mr. Paris talked about China now, there hasn't been a broader discussion of China at this conference. Well, <laughs> I, I think that the, the way, uh, I think that the way to structure it next year would be not just to, to focus on China and Africa, but to have a separate panel on China looking at their Uyghur problem. They have eight million Uyghurs uh, in Western China and look at their counterterrorism strategy, which is, to, to put it mildly, rather blunt. I mean, I understand that during Ramadan, they actually did not permit the Uyghurs to fast. Uh, so I think there's a lot that they can learn, but I think that they're ready to engage with us. There's the fastest growing thing in China that I can see are private security companies and think tanks. So I'm gonna urge Boaz and Eitan to reach out, and I'll, I'll introduce them to some, some very good Chinese scholars who can come and start to talk about China's counterterrorism strategy. Okay, but I want to remind to ourselves that we are on Africa panel, okay? <laughs> so I want a question about Africa, if you have uh, some question, yes, please. Somebody want to answer? Concerning the uh, concentration on Ivory Coast, uh, this is because also uh, Akim uh, has uh, established uh, cells in, in south of uh, Mali, and uh, this is uh, belongs to uh, and the, and the, like Masina, yes, is uh, established is based on the uh, Fulani uh, ethnicity. So we found out that uh, some of the tacos in Ivory Coast were from Fulani. So this is because of logistic matters and, uh, and change of, uh, it's, it's more convenient also to uh, uh, target uh, these uh, marginal uh, 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 targets. And uh, I, I think another um, interesting thing about the Ivory Coast attacks, if you look try to take a more insider perspective, and one can even say it's conspiracy theory, but um, <coughs> Al-Qaeda had, AQIM had used um, Burkina Faso as a sort of like Switzerland, like do some negotiations there, um, sort of safe place for them. And with the coup in uh, Burkina, uh, they sort of, you know, things changed. And uh, the attack in uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Bamako um, and uh, in Burkina itself, maybe as part of a strategy to tell other governments in the region that uh, we have the capability to attack you, so don't crack down upon us. And they might also be telling governments that the cost in tourism and other loss of revenue from our attacks is X amount. So if you don't pay us this amount in some behind the scenes ransom, then we'll actually do an attack in your country. So that might be a message they're trying to say to Senegal, in addition to the AQM, AQIM IS competition. And keep in mind, documents now that have become public show the AQIM diplomacy with countries like Mauritania, and so it's not that uh, unheard of. I don't think the last days of Boko Haram are at hand um, because they have uh, quite a bit of international support from other groups, whether it's gonna be AQ or IS. <coughs> so they have someone that can keep giving them a lifeline. Um, their ideology uh, that they still had still has followers, so they can you know, reemerge in some other way. And uh, although there's been success by the military uh, in terms of pushing them out of cities and into the countryside, groups can live a long time in the countryside, like you see the FARC in Colombia for several decades. So at least in the countryside, you're gonna have BH around. And in a volatile country like Nigeria, if there's ever some political crisis again, which could happen, uh, you know, electoral you issues, then the people in Boko Haram can come from the countryside back to the cities. So the key for Nigeria is not to make an unforced error, like you do in tennis now, and just to keep the pressure on. Regarding Boko Haram, uh, two comments I have. Uh, one, I'm uh, many years in this field, I didn't see an organization that disappeared. 
based on, specifically when we are describing a radical ideology that Boko Haram is one of the organizations that based on this uh, uh, radical ideology. So they can divide it, they can build another new name. So organization do not disappear within this field of what we are dealing with, global jihadists. The second uh, uh, topic that uh, I heard during the presentation that was he uh, were here is the story of lone wolves on Africa soil. And there are, the, until today, and they, it really, uh, uh, what you said, uh, I accept it. Until today, they didn't, we didn't find out a lone wolf operation and a lone wolf strategy on Africa soil. It doesn't say that tomorrow morning it will not be, it will not, uh, be uh, uh, this kind of uh, modus operandi on Africa soil. Because this is something that we face within the international community of the global jihadists, that they use modus operandi, success, the success modus operandi to carry out an attack when they have the opportunity. So if they have uh, an organization capabilities, let's say for instance, don't leave me alone. <laughs> if they have international uh, a, a capability, let's say, let's say for instance in Northern Africa, and now they want to attack or take a, to carry out an attack in uh, a Southern Africa, and they don't have uh, an organization capability, they can do it by lone wolf. So we can find out attacks that was carried out in other a, a, a states on Africa soil that are not really a state that we have ISIS or Al Qaeda or others that they are attacked by lone wolf, that they are connected or disconnected to this organization. So we need to prepare ourselves to all modus operandi of these jihadists carried out in different parts around the world. This is the reason why we are studying international experience regarding what we need to do in our uh, state. Another question? Yes, please. In the case of Boko Haram and, and that ideological dispute, th they are already fighting themselves. It's incredibly common for jihadist groups to, to fight themselves. I mean, ISIS and Al-Qaeda used to be themselves also. They used to be the same. But, but I, as you mentioned, uh, they fight each other, but then for strategic reasons, factions break away because they're angry, and then they join the other. So they, they morph, they, they mold, they change their names, they fight each other, they kill each other. The dominant one wins, maybe, but then the dominant one persists and eats up the ones who have been on the losing faction. Um, so th there, there's a lot of uh, sort of selfish interests. Uh, maybe you preach a certain ideology because you can get more money that way. Um, maybe, you know, ISIS at one point said you need to start talking. Actually, at one point, BH started talking about the Shiites. They used to not care that much about the Shiites. I don't know. I assume this is because they were about to join ISIS, and ISIS told them now you need to target the Shiites, and then they did a suicide bombing on the Shiites in Nigeria. So, I mean, there, there is that self-interest type stuff in addition to the, you know, true believing type stuff fighting with each other happens, and all that mishmash. But uh, sometimes it actually meet, it's like a form of survival of the fittest, and it can mean that the better one wins and becomes better as a result. Okay, last question. Yes, please. I talked about Al Shabaab. Um, I think Al Qaeda is better at penetrating ISIS than ISIS is at penetrating Al Qaeda because ISIS broke from Al Qaeda, so Al Qaeda knows its pre existing net networks and it knows who sort of went in. And Al Qaeda is like older, they're savvier. Some of them have been doing stuff since the 1970s. So, I mean, some of them were involved in assassinating Anwar Sadat. 
So, I mean, they know how to penetrate networks. They have that mental networks. Those people are now in Syria who, who were involved in stuff in Egypt in the 70s. So, I mean, I think they're more clever than ISIS. Um, and therefore, I think it will be more difficult the other way. Moreover, Al-Qaeda has been killing the people in ISIS that try to break away or penetrate. Al-Shabaab killed a lot of people that broke to ISIS. AQIM killed people that went to ISIS, but they don't advertise it because they don't want to be perceived as killing Muslims. Um, and there is actually some intelligence uh, benefits to this if uh, governments can use it, because sometimes you do get defectors as a result of this, people who are angry, and then you can get information from them and then maybe attack a leader of a, one of these factions. So th that is important, um, but like you need to be very clever from the counter intel uh, perspective to benefit from the factions. You can't just uh, look at it from the outside. You need to get into the details and, and maybe break up some cells that way. It's possible. Jonathan, you want to comment? No, that's fine. Fine. Okay, last question. <laughs> I can't, so you are my student, so you have it. Somebody want to answer? I have just a suggestion for the people here. If you read the French, this is an extremely simple and basic book on the Arab countries. And every year they do a new edition. So it's quite updated. It's very simple, it's nothing. That you have, but it's full of maps and history that maybe you <coughs> could. Okay, so I, I need to add there, uh, you want to say? No, you please. go first. No, no, no. Yeah. Thank uh, you. I think it's possible to predict where the next uh, Boko Haram will be uh, by looking at long-term trends, and particularly I'm struck by demography. In, in one of Eitan's slides, he talked about the percentage of Muslims in, in sub-Saharan African countries. But the m more gripping statistic, I in addition to that, is the fact that the birth rate in West, East, and Central Africa is out of control. It's 5.5 TFR. That means every woman's having five and a half babies. Now, there are some exceptions like Kenya, uh, Ethiopia is coming down, Rwanda, of course, and Ghana. But this is an enormous baby bulge. So the combination of what he's saying and what we see overall in demography can only lead to more radicalization, marginalization in the next 15 years. Uh, I'll also just add briefly, it, it's very interesting if you look at the discourses in Nigeria in say 2010, before BH declared its jihad. People said, we'll never have a suicide bombing here, it'll never happen, this is Nigeria. I mean, can you believe where we're at two thousand now? There's been not just thousands, of, you know, a thousand suicide bombers, but like 200 women suicide bombers in the country. So, I mean, it's just amazing to follow the discourses. So now in Senegal, people say, uh, oh, it would never happen here, but you have similar trends that you've seen in Nigeria there. Ghana, you know, y it's part of that same region. Uh, it's even closer to Nigeria style. It's English speaking too. So, I mean, you're right that instead of investing resources where everything is already messed up, maybe focuses on places that are still li looking, looking, yeah, sorry, yeah, comparatively. So you can see that everyone uh, on this pa panel accept the concept that if bad people came to the neighborhood, I need to be prepared even if the bad people is not in my country. And this is something that everyone needs to learn from the experience of others. Because they are not coming to the neighborhood to say hello through the window. They are coming to the neighborhood to enter into your house. So this is the reason why everyone needs to be prepared. Thank you very much for you, for your patience. And next year, you are the manager here.